Okay, we're going to call to order the Committee of the Whole Meeting for Tuesday, January 23rd, 7.30 p.m. First item on the agenda is roll call. Rosado? Here. Atac? Here. Stark? Here. Chancet? Wolf? Here. Salvati? Here. Brown? Here. O'Brien? Here. Callahan? Here. Meitzler? Here. Malay? Ewer? Here. Cerrone? Here. And McFadden? Here. Okay, let the record reflect that Alderman Stark is with us via telephone. Susan, are you there? Yep. Okay. All right, we're going to go on then to item two, item two, which is the approval of the minutes for October 10th, October 11th, November 14th, November 28th, and December 5th. Anybody have any questions or comments on those minutes? If not, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Motion, motion by ATEC, second by Silvati. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion's carried. Mm -hmm. Item three is items removed, added, or changed. We are going to remove item number 12, and there are no other items to remove or add that I know of. Anybody else have anything? Okay. Item four, matters from the public for items that are not on the agenda. So if you have something for us that you'd like to address us on that is not on the agenda, now would be the time. If you want to talk to us about something that is on the agenda, what we normally do is we have staff do the presentation on whatever the item is, and then we have some communication between committee members and just try to make sure you get my attention. I'll make sure we get you up here. Next item is item number five, which is the consent agenda. We have two items on that. Resolution 18-09-R, authorizing execution of a one-year renewable contract for 2018 Westside Property Maintenance with WA Management Incorporated for $55,500. Item B is Resolution 18-11-R, authorizing purchase of two 2018 Ford 250 pickup trucks from Landmark Ford for $67,083. Anybody have any comments, questions on that? Can I get a motion, please? So, so moved. moved. Motion by Wolf, second by Metzler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion's carried. Item six, presentation on the Flag Day Memorial from Austin Dempsey. Austin. Thank you very much. Good evening and Happy New Year. Thank you for taking the time to hear me out this evening. I'm here representing the Fox Valley Patriotic Organization. And as everyone is probably asking themselves, what is the Fox Valley Patriotic Organization? Well, I will tell you, it is an organization that uh, began in a Batavia Access Committee meeting uh, several years ago. Uh, for those that many of you know, I'm involved in uh, uh, Batavia Access and raising money for the Batavia Fourth of July Fireworks Sky Concert every year and as a number of other folks who are sitting in this room are also involved with that group. Um, a couple years ago Mrs. Schelke and the mayor uh, approached the committee and made mention that uh, we had the 100th anniversary of Flag Day coming. Uh, Dr. Sagrand uh, was successfully able to petition uh, President Woodrow Wilson in 1916 to dedicate the uh, June 14th uh, to be the uh, anniversary of uh, Flag Day, or the foundation of Flag Day. And given the fact that Dr. Sagrand did live in Batavia and uh, was an active member of the community back then, uh, we wanted to try to do something special. So a number of people got together. Long story short, we had a um, uh, citizens advisory committee that that came together and uh, talked about what we could do to try to honor Dr. Sagrand's legacy right here in Batavia. Flag Day came around. We did a great ice cream social. We had some special fireworks on June 14th. Hopefully, all of you had an opportunity to attend. Uh, and uh, we unveiled a concept rendering on Flag Day that. Uh, looks fairly similar to this, uh, which you see in front of you and what you'll see on the screens momentarily. 
Uh, so the Flag Day Committee, uh, which is a great uh, group of volunteer citizens, mostly made up of Batavians, got together and out of that the idea to create a living legacy uh, to Dr. Sagrand, uh, but more importantly, uh, Dr. Sagrand's passion about honoring the United States flag and what it represented, not just to us local residents, but to everyone uh, that's a, uh, it's American, resident, American citizen and, and throughout uh, history uh, in, in all forms uh, around the world. So uh, the Citizens Committee got together and uh, commissioned uh, local architect Steve Vassilian and a design was uh, created. This is probably the ninth design revision of it, maybe tenth. Um, uh, but what we did is we uh, we came up with a concept to 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 create this monument uh, to honor the uh, the, un the United States flag and honor key moments in time that helped define uh, why we should honor the United States flag. And uh, we decided from that group that we needed to uh, raise some money to build this. So we created a, in 2017, we created a um, registered 501c3 not-for-profit charity here in Batavia called the Fox Valley Patriotic Organization. So I'm here today representing that group to discuss this monument. Not with me, but uh, in addition to uh, myself on the board are Linda Schelke, Marty Callahan, who's an alderman here, uh, Justin Smitherin, who is a... Uh, uh, Air Force vet, um, Eddie Perez, who's a former police officer and has a, is a business owner in town, uh, Steve Anderson, who is uh, currently a um, representative in Springfield for our district, uh, local citizen Lizzie Evanson, and U.S. Congressional of Medal of Honor recipient Alan Lynch. So we've assembled a pretty good group made up of um, several veterans, several community activists, and several folks who uh, also believe that uh, this concept is good. So let me tell you why I'm here. I'm here because we have gotten to the point now where we need to identify a location. And in many separate meetings with the city staff uh, and Laura, who has been amazing to helping us try to find the location for this, uh, our intention was always to have someplace prominent, some place that, that fit within the confines of the city of Batavia because we did want to ha have this located in, in the city. Um, so we looked at a number of iterations, uh, found out that the park board or park district would be involved with several of those. So we had a series of conversations and presentations to the Batavia Park District. Um, that, those were uh, in 2017. Uh, the design and the concept moved around several times, but today, we're here to uh, put on the table and ask for some uh, permission uh, to potentially locate it on city property located adjacent to City Hall, basically between uh, the front door to City Hall and the Peg Bond Center. So if you would look at the screens briefly. This site probably doesn't need a ton of uh, orientation for you, but uh, the Peg Bond Center is is on the lower left-hand corner of the screen, uh, and City Hall is on the right-hand corner. The p uh, piece of property that we're, we're talking about trying to put this monument uh, would be kind of dead center in between. Uh, there is the windmill circle up here. Um, in a few conversations with the city staff, it was determined that there could be some rework or redesign of that uh, it could, that could be part of this project. Um, so uh, I'm going to flip to the next one, uh, next slide in a second. Uh, but please note that um, the Circle Children uh, sculpture uh, does get relocated as part of this suggestion at this point. So this suggestion is the uh, uh, monument, kind of dead center in between Peg Bond and City Hall. The circle uh, statue gets moved over here. Uh, I'll flip back to the previous one, and you can see right there is just basically a landscaped area now. Uh, in preliminary conversations with the park board, they didn't think that would be an issue to move this uh, statue over there because that is on park district property. Um, the windmill circle goes away. Um, you know, the windmills could be placed uh, in various locations throughout the remaining balance of the grass area, area here. Um, but as you can see, we do take up some of the parking in the, the uh, roundabout circle, so there could be an opportunity here to reconfigure that to something that's um, easier for citizens to, uh, to navigate. Um, 
This monument, uh, I'm going to walk through the monument uh, concepts and renderings in a, in a second here, but uh, it is a 50 foot in diameter um, concrete surface uh, with a helix shaped wall in it that is a uh, timeline reflecting the foundation of the country all the way up to uh, Flag Day on 2020 when we hope to dedicate the project uh, and a brick walkway leading up to uh, the monument. Uh, this shows more brick than probably would be. This is right now a, a, a con this is right now just a grassy area, but this all could be uh, memorial bricks uh, leading up to the walkway. All of this is basically predicated on the point that we do need the city's permission to move forward with something like this because it is on city property. Um, there's probably a lot of questions coming about what is this going to look like and how much is this going to cost and I'll get to all of that in a second. Uh, I'm going to load up a quick video here. Probably. All right, excellent. Uh, this is the this is just an architect's rendering of the design concept. Final design will be uh, finished after we have location uh, adjusted, so we can uh, make any accommodations for the, the the parameters of the site. But I'm going to kind of play this through and pause it in a few spots to discuss. Uh, the monument. So front and center in the monument, of course, is Old Glory, is the United States flag, uh, and then um, radiating out of the central flagpole. Uh, hard to see on here, but I've got some larger uh, copy, or larger display boards I can put up in a minute. Um, ever, in 25-year increments, starting at 1776 and going all the way around uh, 2016. Um, and radiating out of there will be a copper band, uh, all central, you know, all roads lead to Rome, all, all points here lead to the, uh, the, the U.S. flag in the center, as that is the central component to this monument. So the interesting thing, we have five monument pillars around the edges here. Uh, there's a, it's a five-point U.S. star. There's a lot of symbolism that goes into this. Um, so each one of those five pillars would be dedicated to um, a specific moment in flag history, in U.S. history for the flag. Uh, we've got some ideas on what those would be. One of them would be hopefully dedicated to Dr. Grand for his contribution to uh, not only Batavia, but also to the honor and legacy of the U.S. flag. Um, in addition, there could be the landing on the moon, the writing of the Star Spangled Banner, there could be Iwo Jima, important flag moments. Those will be determined after we move forward. Uh, we will have five, but the exact moments would be uh, put together by a group of volunteer citizens from Batavia that we'll bring together. This helix design is an interesting concept. Radiating out of the center point, coming to the very edge of the wall is the year 1776, the foundation of the United States of America. The wall <laughs> height at that point is about three feet two inches. Interestingly, what we've discovered is the population of the United States has increased at a rate of about 1% every year with the exception of World War I and World War II, uh, where in world, I don't remember which, but the population actually declined briefly in one of those years and remained flat in the other. The wall, the helix wall, actually increases at the same rate that the population of the United States increases every year. So as it goes around, it starts at three feet two inches. It ends at eight feet six inches. The visual is when you go in, you're looking down at the small but promising beginnings of the United States. And by the time you finish your way around at the edge of the wall, you're looking up at what this, this country has become. Inside the monument, you're going to notice there's a red, white, and blue um, band. Uh, each one of the bands will represent, um, red will represent the 26 different versions of the United States flag that we've had fly over our, our great nation. Uh, the blue will represent each of the years and the periods of time that the nation was under conflict. And white will represent a number of historical monuments, both national and local, that are important to, the United, to not only the United States, but to Batavia, since it's going to be located right here in the home of Flag Day. And then you're going to see different uh, plaques, and they're just represented with squares in there on the video, but each one of those will represent uh, really significant moments in time as well. So I will continue to play the video around. The 
and the people are put in there just for some height references. But you can see this would be one of the monuments. We'll probably have uh, a finishing piece to the top of this uh, that, so it'll look roughly like the Washington Monument, uh, but we'll have the lights shining up at the flagpole. Oops. Uh, each one of the monuments will have a display plaque, uh, and those would look something like Here's one of the concepts that we had with uh, the U.S. flag being placed on the moon by Buzz Aldrin, who, by the way, has a, the mayor has constantly reminded us, has a very strong, that mission has a strong Batavia um, connection, so we can put that uh, on that as well. You can see the 1776, you can see the different dates as they radiate out and the copper bands that, that run central to the, to the flagpole. Uh, and then we don't know how many plaques will be on the inside. We just sprinkled some in there. It would be kind of depending on budget and a committee that gets together and comes up with the um, things that we believe, uh, the, rel the events that we, we believe would be relevant. But the Helix design is, is again, it's, it's multiple iterations of it. And Steve Vassilian, for those that know Steve, is an amazing architect locally, and we're delighted to have him work with us. The other interesting thing about the flagpole is we're going to try to uh, use some modern day engineering uh, to come up with something pretty unique because this is not just a, this is not just a, a legacy project to continue Dr. Sagran's mission today. We have an opportunity, all of us, to keep that spirit going, to keep defining that legacy and we can be part of that. But we also have an opportunity, we think this is going to become a, a, a regional and certainly maybe a national monument where we can bring people in and do some education on Batavia's role in the history of this country, but as well as the, the, the role of the flag uh, and Dr. Sagrand. The concept that we're coming up with it will either be a sundial or we might try to do a refracting prism at the very top of the flagpole. So. So at the very top of the flagpole, we've got a reflecting prism shown here. The idea is in the ground surrounding the uh, monument, we have the capacity to specifically gear and um, have the top of the flag, either the shadow or the sun as it reflects through that prism, uh, hit specific markers in the, in the area of the campus around uh, the, uh, the monument. The concept behind this could be uh, for significant events in U.S. history. So in theory, and we'll engineer this, uh, but in theory, uh, we could have light hit the top of the flagpole on September 11th at exactly 8.58 or whenever the first plane hit the World Trade Center, and we could have that beam shoot down and for that exact moment in time, line up with a monument marking that occasion that would have this be not only an interactive but a great educational event in addition to the helix wall and to be able to take something that's a living part of our history, the U.S. flag, and incorporate it with some really cool science, which we think will be a great thing for schools and uh, educational purposes. So we've got just an idea here of, of showing how this would work. And we've just got a couple that we've put down here uh, to try to get uh, time and date because uh, as the world goes around and uh, every year uh, the specific dates hit, so we wanted to see kind of just an idea of what it could be. And this is just an idea of the, the marker. We, could, we haven't fully designed what this would look like yet, but it gives you a sense of, of really trying to create something that's, that's unique and dynamic and would be a heck of an attraction for uh, the city of Batavia. So, this monument is an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, for us to continue Dr. Sagran's legacy, the 100-year-plus <coughs> legacy dedicated to our great national pride and gives us an opportunity to leave a lasting legacy to help educate the future of America who comes here, especially our local citizens and their next generation of children who come and look at this monument and have an opportunity to see it hasn't always been easy. In fact, most cases, every generation has struggled with problems, with issues, with war, with conflict. But together, America has always banded together and been one nation under one flag. 
under God. So you're probably asking yourself, geez, this looks like it's expensive. How are you going to do this? How are you going to raise the money to do it? Well, I've got good news. We've, we've kind of thought that through. We created a registered 501c3 not-for-profit, so we are a charitable organization. So if anyone, audience included, is interested in making a donation, you can do that and get a uh, full tax write-off uh, for that donation. Uh, but in addition to that, we, uh, we've got a preliminary budget. Uh, we believe it's going to cost about $600,000 to construct the monument, which is not an insignificant number. However, uh, we are optimistic that we might be able to work with some local contractors to help bring that number down. Uh, we will get to that point after we have an opportunity to get the site look finalized and then we can get construction drawings built. Um, I will tell you that we have successfully to this point uh, raised $265,000 already, uh, which is uh, almost halfway. Uh, which is pretty incredible considering in addition to the people in this room, there's like 50 other people that know that we're doing this. So I think that's a, a really good start. Uh, we're going to raise the rest of the money by having a few spots uh, on those obelisks, on those five points that uh, a company or a charitable individual could donate to and they'll get a little plaque on there. Uh, and then as I mentioned before, we're going to be doing a brick walk uh, and a brick, so it'll be an opportunity for anyone in Batavia, Geneva, St. Charles, Washington, D.C., North Korea, wherever, to pay for a brick and, and inscribe that, and we will put it out there. So um, it'll give an opportunity for local folks uh, and regional and national people to be able to participate and have a little piece of this continuing legacy of Dr. Sagrand. On this site, just to kind of close the loop on the site that we're looking for here, uh, we've got, okay, there we go. Um, so we've got the uh, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. to show kind of the region in there that we could do the historical markers. I've placed a couple of those on there just to give some, some perspective on it. Uh, and this kind of just shows a couple of different sun uh, uh, shadow renderings. Uh, and then I like this view. This is good. I think it's, you know, one of the things that you guys have done a great job as a city in working with the Park District to create a real downtown campus uh, feel. And uh, one of the things we were very cognizant of is, we you know, we wanted to put a monument kind of smack in the middle. Uh, and I believe it, it does a good job of being very complementary uh, to, to what's already created down here. From a size perspective, um, interesting thing is the platform, the monument dais, the circle in here, is exactly, the, almost exactly the same as the um, floor space for the band shell. So if anybody is wondering how big it is, they can walk out there after the meeting and walk it off just to get a sense. But um, I hope you are as interested as I am in, in trying to move this forward. We are looking for a contribution of some land. Uh, to the city, but we're not looking for the city to be involved uh, in any capacity really after that. Um, in addition, one of our plans, we've started an uh, uh, advised fund, an endowment fund at the Community Foundation of the Fox River Valley out of Aurora to cover the ongoing maintenance of this. So we'll not be asking for the city of Batavia and or the park district to really have any maintenance costs associated with this project um, other than maybe a little bit of traffic engineering and obviously getting the, getting the facility sited. But for ongoing maintenance, uh, our plan is to raise enough money that we can, uh, in perpetuity, uh, maintain this as a first class uh, and world class uh, monument here in Batavia. So our next steps. Our great friends of the Park District have asked that I come and present to the city and get the city's blessing on this site. And then I need to go present to the Park District and get the Park District's blessing. <laughs> There's a little bit of a one of these on who actually owns the property. So I figured, you know, maybe the best thing to do is just let's get everybody to sign on with it. So uh, rather than kind of getting, you know, going through that, we're going to have an opportunity, hopefully, for us all to work together. After we get that, we will execute our contract with uh, Vassilian Architects here in Batavia to finish the design once we have the site selection set. Uh, from that, we'll get construction documents. Um, these are 
documents that are going to have every nook and cranny and uh, every detail for the monument, and then we're going to send them out to contractors. Uh, we're going to be talking to local contractors. We're going to be talking to veteran-owned contractors and anybody else who's interested in participating in the project. And we're hopeful and optimistic that uh, a lot of the contractors will see the benefit in, in their company being associated with this, and hopefully that leads to some advantageous pricing. Uh, we're going to fundraise. So we've got about half the money already uh, committed to, which is, which is outstanding because we really haven't started fundraising yet. Uh, and the best part about it is uh, we received two foundational grants, one from the Community Foundation of the Fox River Valley in Aurora and the Dunham Fund in Aurora. Uh, so we've received over $200,000 of fund commitment from people who aren't even in Batavia, which we think is a good thing and is a testament to the fact that this actually is going to be very regional in, in, in its scope and not just um, um, a Batavia focus. And you'll be happy to know that Aurora has contacted us and tried to get us to put this in downtown Aurora, but we think we're gonna keep it in Batavia for now. So hopefully you guys will work with us and we can put that to a rest either tonight or subsequently at the next council meeting. Uh, once we have this uh, site selected, we'll do the drawings, we'll begin fundraising, we're gonna fundraise through the bricks, we're gonna fundraise through a crowdfunding campaign, uh, we'll probably have an event or two, and our goal is to unveil this monument and cut the ribbon on Flag Day, which happens to be June 14th of 2020, which is a Sunday. And I'm already sensing that Dr. Sagrand is going to help us have a great weather day that day because it's an outdoor event. Um, and hopefully this is an opportunity for us to get uh, a lot of citizens involved. There's already a number of local Batavia residents from a uh, multitude of different sides of town and various interests and park board and library board and school board and uh, citizens from the Batavia Access Committee, which raises money every year for the 4th of July fireworks. There's a big group together that's, that's, that's going to be uh, moving forward to finalize the design and uh, the plaques and the monument pieces that are going to go to it. So uh, if we get this approved, this is going to be something that's going to be a pretty exciting project for downtown Batavia moving forward. I'm available, available to answer any questions if anybody's got any. Yes, sir. Uh, a few questions. One, uh, this location is great. When it first came out, we were talking about off, or it was mentioned off Houston Street, and there was concerns that there's a lot of events downtown. Um, so I like that this is kind of outside the uh, Peg Bond Center view, if you will. But are there concerns? Do you have support from uh, Batavia Main Street and anyone else holding events? Uh, have there been any concerns about this location? Um, we've the first location that we did talk about was kind of prominent right in the middle of the viewing area for, for Peg Bond. And um, after conversations with the Park District and Main Street and other organizations, you know, preserving that area was, was pretty important. Um, this concept's been talked about with a number of different uh, folks. And while this area does occasionally get um, some overflow for a block party or something else, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly not um, kind of prime. Uh, event property, and in, depending on what happens around it, if I go back a couple, actually, this one will work fine. Uh, you can see we're actually collecting some of the potential street area here and windmill circle, which doesn't really get a lot of use, mm -hmm. um, and, and we're getting additional overflow space there. So I think it's a combination of um, kind of the best of both worlds. We actually do create the space that we do take up, I think we make up for by, by recapturing some of that roadway. Yeah, I, I agree. I just wasn't sure if everyone else agreed. Uh, and then what, preliminary, I, I don't know if anything's up there. The, the bricks, what are you guys looking for from sponsorship? Well, that's a great question. We're currently investigating a gentleman who grew up in Batavia who owns a brick company uh, <laughs> to see if they would be interested in maybe making donations, in which case we think we can bring the cost of the bricks down. But we're thinking somewhere in the range of 200 to 300 dollars per brick just and they're going to be a little bit larger than just like a standard brick they're going to be 
I forget the exact measurement, but slightly larger. And that gets a, a name? That would get a certain amount of characters that you're able to put on there, and we're working with a, a local company to uh, design a web portal onto our website so people can go on and put it in there, and then we'll just need to engage a group of volunteers to just edit, just check that, make sure there's <laughs> everything's kosher. Thank you, that's all I have. Yep. Yes, sir. It, yeah, it looked to me like you probably actually gained some green space by doing this. Um, so that actually, I think that balances out. The $600,000, i am assuming, does not include fixing the roadway, or does it? It does not. Okay. Yes. Great clarification. Okay. Um, but otherwise, I I think that fits in nicely. And with the extra green space, so that, that takes away any of my concerns. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions, was the total cost with rerouting the road, moving all the windmills, putting pads up for wherever the windmills end up. I mean, to me, there's more cost to that, and I think we have to take all that into account to figure out how we would be able to do that, especially given other things on our agenda tonight. <laughs> Austin, I, I, uh, as you know, I'm supportive of this memorial. Um, I think it's a great location, actually, the more I look at it, when you first presented it, I didn't like the idea of taking away the windmill circle. Um, but you are, gain, grain, you are gaining green space by doing this, I think it looks like. And as I think about the loss of the windmill circle, I'm thinking that maybe that loss is overcome by a gain. Because not only are you gaining this memorial and more green space, but those windmills are out there basically in the middle of a street. So even though it's not used very much, to have people walking across the street in all different directions. I don't think that that windmill circle really, as many times as I'm down here and you look around, you don't see people walking over there to see what those windmills are all about. Where if they were to be staggered around in that area there, even with other events going on that they could put tents around them, you know, in different areas, it, that they could still be staggered in the area, I think people would come to appreciate the windmills and the significance of them even more. So I, I think it's a pretty good idea. Thank you. Going off of exactly what you said, it wasn't one of my first spots initially where I was thinking it was going to go. I wanted it more towards the pivotal front and center, but we looked at many different locations about where this would ultimately go, and we kept gravitating towards making sure that it remained somewhere in the pivotal center of the downtown area, thereby gaining more bang for the buck for what we have spent as a city of the entire vision of the downtown and as part of that when we do have events we know we noticed that this is an area that is in the overall concept greatly underutilized and we're hoping that this becomes a larger area where people will be spreading out and more connectivity for wanting to walk to those areas and not have dead zones so that when you're having the festival, more people are spreading out, more people are walking along the, along the, uh, the uh, river trail and the entire area, thereby exactly what Dave's picking up is pulling it in more and making it more cohesive as an entire downtown area. Yeah. I think one of the things that having me part of this a little bit uh, that excites me is this isn't just, it's not just a little model. It's just not just a little attraction. Um, th this is a destination. Um, and this, it, this really falls within what we're trying to do within our community. Um, it will drive people to our downtown because it, this is not just a local attraction, not just a regional attraction. This could, this could really gather some nationwide attention, which I think is pretty exciting. I, I will make a note to that. There are only two living Medal of Honor recipients in the state of Illinois at this point, and uh, Al Lynch lives in Gurney. Uh, and when he found out that we were trying to put this together in Batavia, uh, he called me up and said, uh, he's in, let him know what he can do to help. Um, now, Al is in the process of a multi-state <coughs> book tour um, with the Pritzker Military Library and potentially in discussions with he wrote a book about his life and his story, and 
that could be pretty exciting to be tied in with that. But the interesting thing about that and how small of a world it is, Al's daughter teaches at Rotolo. So when he found out that we were trying to do this in Batavia, he was even more thrilled about it too, which is, which is great. And he's put me in contact with several of the folks who are former veterans, and, uh, or I should say veterans, uh, and um, there seems to be a lot of very large regional attention just in some preliminary discussions on this. So we could end up, you know, this could, I think this will drive not only a lot of people to downtown to many of your points, but I think this will be a, a great opportunity for some, uh, to, for, for us to really showcase the fact that we are a community that rolls up its sleeves and, and makes things happen when we work together. Austin, have you had any conversation yet with, like, engineering and police? I mean, this is a pretty important area for, for police, and of course we got river rain up there, mm -hmm. and you're taking away the turnabout, the turnaround. So now, as people drive north, whether they know where they're going or they don't know where they're going, they're not e easily able to just turn around and go back out. Uh, I have not. That's a that is a good point. I have myself uh, witnessed on a number of occasions, uh, folks actually driving the wrong way down that, around that circle, because uh, my kids like this park and we come play there all the time. And to your point earlier, we never cross over to the windmill circle. Um, but those would be good conversations for us to have kind of a, the, the, the next step if we get you know, preliminary approval that, that this group thinks this is the right spot. Just uh, getting back to what you say, I mean, I, I love the vision of this, I, I love the possibility of the congregation of people that it could bring just, again, walking through, um, crossing the other side of the river. Um, and, and I think that in particular, it's going to really help um, just add to some of the backdrop. Um, you know, people sitting, um, you know, at some of the local restaurants on the patios, and you see that in the backdrop, I mean, that that's awesome. Um, you know, and, and I, I hear the concern about the, the cost of, you know, obviously street escaping, um, you know, changing the flow of that traffic, cutting curb, relocating windmills. Um, but I, I think this is one of those things that's similar to all the um, charitable contributions just going to de generate this monument. This is something that I think the town could get behind and get creative to help support and fund and, and make this a reality. So I, I would definitely support this. Good, thank you. I, I think this looks, is a super area. I think it makes a super entrance to the government center. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I mean, as we're trying to rework the front, I, I mean, I don't think we could ask for anything better than this. I am a little concerned about the loss of the circle, so I hope that we could look into that because I, I see people using it. So, I mean, but maybe it doesn't have to be right there, but there needs to be some turnaround, I mm -hmm. think, at some point. Um, and I, I know you talked about this, and I can't remember, and I know you don't have all the details, but what are you thinking about um, adding for the actual history of the flag? I mean, you've talked about a lot of historical things mm -hmm. with our nation, but as kids come along, they're going to, I don't know, it seems like, is there something about, like, Betsy Ross and the different... Yep, that's a great point, and I probably didn't illustrate that enough. The, each one of the red, so there have been 26 different versions of the U.S. flag that have been official flags uh, that have flown over our country. So each one of the red bands on there uh, will represent the period of time that each one of those flags have flown, and then we're going to have a historical marker talking about I might that have flag. That part of it. I, I didn't a lot, I know if so I, I, yeah. But so like the, when Illinois became a, a state, right? So the flag was changed when Illinois became a state. Okay. We'll have a plaque talking about the the date. What, why that was significant and that type of stuff. So we will, there will be, a, it is a timeline from the birth of our nation to today, um, but is going to be, is going to be, there will be a lot of um, flag centric and flag geared um, historical information on there. And our uh, friend George Sheets uh, is very interested in participating and helping us oh, great. identify <laughs> be each of those. Of yes. I mean, I think that Lucy's point about that is absolutely one of the, the highlights that we were thinking about with it, that it's not just a tourist destination, but it is that we were completely seeing that it was school trips from up and down the Fox Valley as, a, as an educational destination, that it had to have those components of not only seeing something that was nice and honoring, but that you learned something about it, meaningful. Yep. Mm. Mayor? Yeah, I certainly want to go on record as being a supporter of this. Uh, I guess the concerns I would have 
is number one, I would I certainly would want to see the windmills move to another location, perhaps inside the circ inside the area behind where the memorial is going to be. I mean, that was originally put there to honor the three major windmill companies, and I think that's something that we need to do. Batavia's had some taken some hits because we haven't always done the best job of maintaining uh, community donations and historical monuments. Mm -hmm. And there's some stuff that wasn't properly handled, and I think that those, mo those windmills really do have a very important <coughs> moment in Batavia history that needs to be part of this. And I think bringing these two together really is something positive. I probably have a little bit different view on that circle out there because being down here every day, I can think of three times now that I've seen some situations involving the circle which dropped my stomach. Uh, this, the circle has a tendency to get over higher grass and, and weeds, or not weeds, but bushes around it. And so I've seen a couple of occasions when children were playing in the in this playground over there and suddenly an you know, older one gets the idea he wants to run over and see the windmills. And so they go running out into the street to get to the windmill. And several times I've seen people coming out of river rain or whatever have you, and all of a sudden, here comes this kid out of the <coughs> window circle running into the street to go back over to the playground equipment. And I've also seen another occasion when there, I believe he was a resident of river rain, a gentleman was out there in a walker. And again, it was the same thing. He was moving pretty slow and he just stepped into the street and somebody came around the curb and there he was. Unfortunately, everybody put their brakes on and nobody got hurt. But that is a little bit of a, of a traffic barrier there and I just worry that someday something was gonna happen and by taking the windmills and putting them all on, on more solid ground, I'll call it, getting them out in the middle of the street, I think would be a safety benefit that would be serving the community for many years to come. Anybody else? <laughs> Mike? You know, I supported this when you guys first presented it. Uh, I'm glad you located an area that everyone seems to be you know, in agreement with. I, I, you know, I thought this, this was a great idea that you guys presented earlier, and, and I still do. And, and I would definitely support this. It's, uh, you know, we have, we have River Street, which is an iconic road. We have the, 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 River Street entrance, which is an iconic entrance, and now we have an iconic piece of uh, history here that I think will, will keep drawing people to us, and, and we're becoming maybe known as you know, an iconic little town in, in the, the, the state of Illinois. So I think, uh, I think it's a great idea. I always did think that, and uh, I would fully support it. Thank you. Laura? I just wanted to mention, you know, sometimes uh, one project prompts another, and there is, um, Chris Cudworth is working with both the library and Batavia Historical Society, as well as those in our community who have always been uh, the caretakers of our windmill collection. And um, he is creating a um, sort of a, a wayfinding to all of the various windmills and a means of connecting the community back with those windmills and at the same time creating a means of future financial support for making sure that we can keep up with the upkeep of that. So um, the, the windmills that are in Windmill Circle will definitely be placed along a path that, as you say, um, when we have community <coughs> events, this will draw people over there and then they'll also have a path they can follow to find all of our lovely windmills too. So I think in the next uh, several years you're going to see some pretty fantastic things happen in the Riverwalk area. Great. Okay, so Austin's kind of looking for some direction here as to whether <laughs> or not we would support, uh, I guess, granting easement to your organization to place this monument there. Anybody have a problem? Are we all good to go? Do it. Sounds like we're all good to go. Thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, work with Laura and her office to uh, address a couple of concerns about the windmills and make sure that everything works with the site and then 
I will look for a call on f as far as what the next steps would be. And then once we have it finalized, then I have to go up the street and present to the our friends of the Park District. So I appreciate everybody's uh, time this evening. Thank you very much. To allay uh, some of what you were saying about the concerns, we're hoping to make sure that this pays for itself. So part of what we probably will be doing is figuring out what those costs are and budgeting so that we can everything figure those things out too yeah. <coughs> okay next item is thanks Austin <coughs> next item is item number seven which is the Main Street preliminary design discussion Alderman Wolf okay, let's see if I can figure out which one it is I'm try to pull this up here <laughs> Okay, um, this is part of our uh, Main Street reconstruction work, and um, read it. Um, we're going to go back through, and we had talked about one of the main areas that we were concerned about was the 700 block. Um, the businesses that are located in there and so I think tonight are we going to try and decide which one of these three we wanted to proceed with for tonight is that what you're going to pull up yeah <laughs> thank you so much <clears throat> thank you so much so as I um, mentioned in my memo, uh, back in uh, 2017, the, the committee requested that or asked us that we bring this concept, um, a couple of concepts uh, back to the committee to discuss how the entrances will look like uh, for the few businesses that are located on um, Main Street. So I have um, our consultant who is uh, doing the design, Civil Tech here, the project manager, Derek Mall, and I also uh, met with the business owners at 715 and 711, and also at Oli's Garage. Um, I didn't meet him, but I emailed him the plan so that they have a chance to, to uh, look at the plans and be, be uh, present at this meeting, and I, I see them here in the meeting. So um, just opening it up for discussion, um, as you can see, the 715, we are proposing at 30 feet uh, curb car, depressed curb, if you want to say it, um, as a driveway entrance. So this uh, keeps that alley entrance open and also um, provides an entryway for 715. Um, 711, we are proposing another 30 feet uh, driveway depressed curb so that um, cars can go in and out of the garage um, door there. Um, at 709, um, we are proposing a 30 feet curb cart with a loading, unloading area. <coughs> we, uh, during, during our phase one um, discussion with Oli's Garage, they uh, indicated that they would like to have a, like a loading, unloading area, especially when they bring in any, any tow trucks, um, cars and stuff, they would like to unload it you know, somewhere on Main Street. So this is, this is alternative A, which is um, the, the distinction between two alternatives. This, so this is alternative A. The distinction is this is 13 feet um, uh, on both directions. So you have 26 feet of roadway plus 8 feet of parking on the north side of the street. This is option A. In option B or alternative B, you can see we are actually tapering the street so it's only 13 feet in one side and 15 feet. So no on-street parking in front of 715 and 711. So we are giving more, um, if you want to say, more areas between the curb and the face of the building in the alternative B. In alternative A, that area is much lesser. So the staff kind of discussed that among ourselves, and we, we are... Um, uh, proposing that uh, the council goes with the alternative B, um, but would be open to uh, the other alternative too. So that's this is B. This is B. So you can see the here the street kind of gets tapered, so it get, the street gets narrow here. So there is the parking from all the way from water street or 31 you know it's it's 13 feet on both lane plus eight feet it's wider here mm -hmm. but it gets narrower here 
so that 715 and 711 both have bigger area to park in front of their building. Can, can you tell us the number of parking spots available now and in, in these two different options? So there is, on street, there is no designated parking now. You know, they, the, the businesses, they kind of pull in in front of 715 right. and 711. So the On the other side of the street, on the south side of the street, there's not any parking? I, I can't remember currently. We, we don't designate but on can street they parking. parking. Can they park there now? Yes, they can, but I think uh, the business owner, he indicated that they I have an arrangement with this business on the south side. Where they have they, a what? They have an arrangement with the business owner at, at the south side, and, and they park in, in that property at this <coughs> point. So since right now they can park on the street? Mm-hmm. Okay, so how many parking, can you estimate number of parking spots in the three different alternatives of existing and then the two others? Just to clarify, Lucy, on the, on the south and the north side right now, it's basically all paved parkway. So if they want to park on the street, they're parking in front of someone's driveway. So there's really no, like, a designated parking spot. Okay, all right, so there aren't any curbs. I mean, I can't, I'm trying to remember. Like in front of the ad agency or what used to be the ad agency, there's not a curb? It, well, if there's a curb, it's it's basically something that's driven over all the time. So I mean, they're, they're, those those two parkways, both yes. on the north and south side, are kind of all. But as you go a, a little bit further so west, west, there yeah. might be a, a little parking area. On like no the parking. north side on or the, the north side? side? No. And there's no, no. There's parking, no parking in front of the old LDNA no. building that's there's on the not? corner. No. no, that's a grass area. There is a curb there. So you yeah. could park on the curb. I know I've curb. hit it. You can park on the curb, though, right? <laughs> no, the you can't park on the curb there. You'd be in the street. Yeah. All right. It's green grass out into the front. The sidewalk is. So there's the south side. You can see the, it's all just paved. So, I mean, you really, when you park there, you'd be parking in front of someone. There. There's a pole, yeah. Okay. You can park there. There's space for three cars there that are used for business for a shop. Jim, would you mind coming up here so we can get you on tape? And I know you've got some major concerns, and I think you've got some ideas that you'd like to share too, so the committee can hear what you've got to say. Right here in this picture here, we are using this space right now, and it is off the street actually. It's not marked for parking, but there's room for parking here. There's room for three cars here. They do use it during business hours. And uh, on the other side of the street, what, what they're proposing here is cutting off, well, if you see in there, my 30 feet comes right out here. And this is going to be my opening. And then they're trying to tell me people are going to pull in here, but they're going to have to drive down the sidewalk to come in and park in front of me. Because I have six spots. I can fit six cars across here. And, you know, it's bad driving across the sidewalk. But now they're talking about driving down the sidewalk, <laughs> which I think is worse than just cutting across the sidewalk. And in uh, 15 years I've owned this, we've never had an accident from somebody backing out into the street. And, you know, they're talking, well, there's ordinances that he has to follow. So I was proposing, there's a telephone pole right here that they made uh, a small island right here to help with that. I, I don't mind because, you know, that helps people from hitting the pole. I've seen two people hit the pole. <laughs> but that, that's the only thing I've seen. There's never been a car accident here. And then if they're talking about putting curbs here, there are tow trucks all the time driving, dropping cars off. You know, and I don't mind because they're, they're there and they're gone. But they pull onto my lot and they back up and they drop cars into these spots. And if they're talking about putting a spot here, then you need a vehicle to push the car off the street 
where actually they're off the street, they're not blocking traffic, you know, and you put cars here, then uh, people going in and out of alleys are going to be driving over the curb <laughs> because they're not used to it. It's been open because that curb goes into his lot too. And, you know, I'm just trying to figure. The only, the only island space I see that makes it still safe is right around the pole and leaving this open so I don't have traffic pulling in here like this and then here like this. You know, trying to straighten out because then you're driving down the sidewalk instead of across the sidewalk. I think that's more dangerous than what I thought we had already. I guess one of the questions I'd have is how are we going to work this, the storm sewer into this if we don't, if we were to do it without a curb in there, does that work or not work? Because one of the, one of the things we're going to be doing when we reconstruct Main Street is adding storm sewer all the way down there. You still got to have the depressed well, curb. Had, right. You, uh, a, like a storm curb mm -hmm. here already. I mean, if they do some, something you can drive over that still controls the water, but doesn't I mean, not a six-inch curve. Like I said, that's our decision is we have to decide how we want to have Main Street. Do we want to have it reconstructed with a curb all the way down it, or do we want to stop it? Well, it's going to have a curb. Way down. It's, it's going to have a curb. It's just whether it's the what press, style the yeah. curb. Yeah. Now, if, if they, can you go to the other side of the street? Because if you're, you guys... They're talking about designing this, cutting this out, and then cutting this entrance out. So if they still left this space for parking, and they designated parking, and started here, and went all the way down here, why well, know there's three cars that have been here already. And this is probably two cars here. And then if they went this way, and I know there's a problem with the uh, other street. So if you go far enough down, you could probably get three more parking places over here if they do the entrance the way you're talking about. Uh, that gives us, you know, five, six extra parking places where then if they put the curb on my side of the street, I, I still have places for customers to park. You know, if they put off, you know, because the street's right here. And this, you know, I plow this, this is it, you but now. So people, <coughs> customers can park there. Mayor. Yeah, I, I certainly have gone, I've gone out there <coughs> myself with my measuring tape and measured this thing. And I started at the, I guess I would say at the east end of Ollie's garage's entrance, and I go to the end of Jim's building, you own uh, 715. And as near as I can tell, it's every time I measure it, I get a different number, but I think it's between 190 and 210 feet. So it's not a real, real big area. You know, I think what this represents is, is that thanks to, you know, Ollie and Jim and grass and those people out there, they have put together kind of a little business district on the far west side of town that's in an area that, you know, we had to find some way to try to bring it back because, quite honestly, after Lingwin Foundry left there, that place was in pretty rough shape. And there's environmental issues and there's a whole bunch of stuff floating around there. And I guess I would be of the mindset that you know, I know in my work in Chicago that these projects can be adapted and be reflect issues that they come up in front of. And many times there's field changes as they begin the construction. And maybe we don't put in a curb or they do put in a curb or whatever it is. So there's no real standard, I don't think, that's cut into stone here that you can't deviate from. I guess I would suggest that we try to minimize, minimize how much curbing we put out there and we leave this 
kind of this kind of na neighborhood friendly business district that Batavia's always had these scattered around town. We had them on North Washington Avenue. We had them on South River Street when I was a kid. Uh, you know, they've been around for a long time and we've used older areas of town to kind of do something. And given all the issues that still are faced out there and hopefully someday somebody will come in and want to utilize the TIF district that's been created out there. But that gas station that's sitting across the street from these guys is probably one of the best eyesores we got in town. And I guess I don't see any need to, you know, being uh, encouraging people to be driving in there and driving around. Uh, you know, I guess they should have a driveway, but I don't think they should have a great big access thing. And the next door to them is the building that the Batavia School District's now doing their bus maintenance. <coughs> and that seems to be a viable use, and that's working. And, you know, Van D, what was Van D is next door, and I think the owners of that are reliable people and certainly would work with us on what we are trying to do. So I don't know if I think this is that big of a deal. <coughs> I would just suggest that that 200, roughly, <coughs> out there on the north side of Main Street, kind of put in with a slope curb that people can easily drive over and keep the sidewalk there. And if we want to curb around the, the utility pole, that's fine, but I wouldn't want to see us do a whole bunch of additional work there because I think it, as it would have a tendency to potentially start to restrict this neighborhood's ability to keep itself alive out there. And I really think that Jim and, and those people that are out there, Beckman's and whatever, have done a nice job of trying to bring a viable <coughs> business into a troubled area. And I would like to see the city do what we can to support them. I couldn't agree more. And what I'm puzzled about is I think that conversation was talked about when we directed staff to look at this area first and their design of Main Street so that we could make sure that this is being addressed before they go to a full set of construction drawings. And I'm kind of surprised to see that this has been presented back to us without those concerns completely taken into consideration, or is there a reason why they weren't? We, we are preparing the construction documents, and the direction that was given to us was that we bring few alternatives back to the council for discussion. Right. So we are bringing it to you to show how this is going to work. This, this, this will be the preference to have, you know, if you, if you have driveway all up and down for 200, 250 feet, and, and you have people on stroller and sidewalk, they will not know when people are coming in and out. That's like a free flow of traffic. It's a 200 feet wide I, I, parking I, lot. I understand that, but now you're proposing that a car actually drive down the sidewalk to pull into a parking we, space in front of the building. We, we are not suggesting that. We are saying there is a designated driveway that you get in, and then it's like a three-car garage or four-car garage if you have. You narrow it down to 20 feet at the street level or sidewalk level, but once you go past the sidewalk level, you kind of widen it. That's why we kind of propose to narrow up the street in front of 715 and Over that won't work. Well, what if it's, how far is it from the building to the sidewalk then in your proposal? I believe it's uh, 33 feet, um, 28 feet. So it's 28 feet, and if a car is parked next to the drive in front of the building and it takes up 20 feet, what, what's the length of a van or a car or a pickup truck? Roughly 20 feet. There wouldn't be room for a vehicle to get around the back of that vehicle <coughs> to pull into the empty spot in front of the building without driving down the sidewalk. And there'd be nothing to prevent them from driving down the sidewalk. I, 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 absolutely. You know, we, we are not replacing what is the number of parking space in front of the business now. By narrowing down the driveway, we'll not be able to replace the actual number of sides the parking spot that's in front of that business. So to the mayor's point, why couldn't it just be put back in kind of as is and let them pull, I mean, it, conduct business as they're conducting business now? I think the intention of staff was to follow what we did on First Street when we replaced the area in front of what was the old bowling alley. And we did that at council's direction because council was concerned that cars were pulling in and across the sidewalk every time they went to park. And we, we've, we created parallel parking spaces there and got the sidewalk out of the path of traffic to address that issue. This particular area, as it exists today, I mean, I've driven by for the last eight months now since we had this conversation, 
almost every time I drive by, there's a car or two overhanging the sidewalk. So by moving the sidewalk further away from the building, you know, you, you, you have a 30-foot driveway in which you can pull in and still have a car or two parked in front of the business and not overhang the sidewalk anymore. How about your sidewalk, though? The sidewalk is here. But if they move the sidewalk to this space here, which is already concrete, or if they even light it up with this sidewalk and brought it down, it comes right on the edge of the pole, when it comes down around here, and that's just changing the sidewalk, and no vehicle uh, would go over the, the sidewalk. Because you can see here right now, that car, and this old car, those are big cars. It is not over the sidewalk. Uh, I mean, even, even on the... Uh, my van, this extended van, it goes over the sidewalk. I, I, I know it does. But I checked, it does not encroach over half that sidewalk. And if you move that just up to the telephone pole and land that new sidewalk, which is going to go in there, two or three feet further <coughs> south, there, there's no problem with a vehicle the no, and I think that's consistent with alternate B, which is what staff's recommending, and moving that sidewalk further to the south to get more room in front of the buildings. Does that put the sidewalk out against the curb then? It does. Yes. Mm -hmm. it does. Carriage walk. Carriage it's a carriage walk. So it would be a carriage walk along here. <clears throat> yeah, I guess I see the the problems with trying to park in front of those buildings if you have a full size curb roughly in 50% of that area. You know, an alternate B. See this area here, the dark spot? That's a <coughs> blacktop that's uh, because this here is the side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just pull that sidewalk down to the, this line, just follow through. It almost stays right in line, and it lines up with the sidewalk down the street. And that is a full-size van there. And you see, that would put the sidewalk, <coughs> you know, just south of the van. I think the alignment of the sidewalk is probably secondary to whether we're going to allow 200 feet of vehicle access versus controlled entrances. Yeah. And the alignment of the sidewalk needs to move farther away from the buildings to keep vehicles off from parking on the side. Well, I'm asking you to provide the parking then. Well, what about the other side of the street that you're cutting off? Put in <coughs> parking here then. Give me some parking. That's all I'm saying. You're taking parking away from me. Well, I, well, I think you have there's, to. There's nothing here except, you're, I mean, you're taking this drive away except for one. And, you saw with no, and I, I think that's part of our concern is that we are not treating the north side of the street similar to how we're treating the south side of the street. And we want to put a sidewalk along the south side of the street. I want to see the sidewalk go through there because we need a sidewalk on that side of the street. Oh, still then you can't have parking on the street there. Because we don't have the right of way unless we take the right of way all the way up to the front of your building, which is where we have right of way. <laughs> Where these bushes are, you take bushes and put the sidewalk right there. And where I showed you that uh, I was parking on the street there, you, you, you can run this sidewalk right along the, the parking. How far does our right of way go on the south side so of the can, street? You can see the right of way right. The right of way You can see the right of way line right here. And then um, we probably have about, looking at this is a five feet sidewalk, we probably have six, seven feet between the right of a line and the curb. So we don't, we don't have enough space there to, to put parking. To put parking, a sidewalk, in. and the, yeah. yeah. See, I don't think it would it, all fit. It will look exactly the same on the north side, that it's a sea of pavement. Because we are widening the roadway a little bit there. It's, you can see that we made the decision to make it 13 feet lane, 
because it's a shared lane for bike path. Mm -hmm. So it's not only car plus bike uh, bikeway. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think if you can't provide the parking on the south side, which to me, just looking at that 13 foot dimension up there, it looks to be like the right, and we're all just guessing, we're engineering by the seat of our pants here. Where it looks to me like it's about a 15 foot right away there when you look at that 13 foot dimension. But again, we're engineering by the seat of our pants. If you can't provide parking for those businesses on the south side, then I think we have to allow the depressed curb to remain on the north side and let them pull across the sidewalk as they're currently doing. We can't be taking parking away. So, because I don't mind if there's a little island here, there's yeah. a pole here, you know. So in that case, we can go back to option or alternative one where we were providing two parking spaces here, keeping the roadway wide. So that would give them how many, how many total parking spaces under that scenario? So there are two spaces here, and as you pull in, you can, um, if I have to take a guess, you can probably park three cars, so total five. Two cars, yeah. So he gets four parking spaces, where currently you got how many? You, you were talking, you might be able to put parking points here. <clears throat> if you're taking three away, and you give me one, two, three, that building has the same amount of... De Derek, I was going to ask you, do you think we'll be able to put <coughs> one here? But see, I have, I have three, 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 three parking there is there is set places distance here. Yeah. from the intersection, because you're coming up to that. To, to Mallory there, so um, uh, be uh, 30 distance. feet is usually a standard distance for sight distance to keep the cars parked. <coughs> uh, better sight distance at the intersections. That's why that strike so out. Talking 30 feet from right here? Yeah. Actually, if you're sitting in a car right here where my pointer is, right. because that's, yeah. Right? Well, I think it's 30 feet Third. from the curb line, where the curb comes this. in. Right here. I mean, and once you take about 30, there's not going to be enough left for a car. It's, well, be 30. I believe it's measured from okay. From this? And if you take, this may be more than 30, <coughs> based on that driveway. But what you have left isn't enough for a full car. So then the whole thing is striped out. Full car is parking there now. It hey, but, but we have to follow the guideline, and, and if you follow the guideline, you cannot stripe it as a parking. Yeah, maybe after the project is done and we can do our own study, but, well, but at this you're, time... You're killing my business if you do that. You're, you're taking my parking places away. Nobody's going to want to rent from me. Yeah. We, know, we can look into the opportunity of providing parking on the south side. Um, the decision was made that the parking will be on the north side, so we didn't even explore the opportunity on the south side. Yeah, we can look into that, but... I mean, the current design of the roadway is that all of the parking was moved to one side of the road, so it's all right. on the north side all the way along. <laughs> so you would be creating a block where you have it on the other the south side of the road. So, just as I see it, right, we're, we're putting all the parking on the north side and nothing on the south side, and all the businesses are on the north side, and the south side relatively empty of businesses, mm -hmm. right? And, and we're not, what we're taking from parking that's there now, we're not putting back on the north side. Is that a true statement? Yeah. If you and count so all... I, I would recommend, and I understand what you're doing, I, and I don't know how to do it, but I'd recommend whatever we're taking from parking, put back parking in either on the south side or north side combined, but whatever we're taking, put back. Because what we don't want to do is, is hurt the businesses. And, and, and I know you're, you're being taxed because you have to follow... The ordinance, and, but no, it, it 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 depends on how we see it. Like we are creating a lot of parking on the north side, from all the way from 31 to Van Northwick. Now, if you want parking in front of your business, it may not be there, but it's there 
along the north side of Main Street. It might be farther away from it is now in front of your business. I think there is a distinction between that, how, how we see that. But people don't want to walk. They're not right, going to right. park down the street to walk to Jim's business because it's a neighborhood business. Well, I think, too, we also have to take into account that the south side of Main Street is not going to stay the same that it is today. Right. It at some point, that's going to get redeveloped. So I think to try to realign that and put parking on the south side doesn't make any sense when we're trying to turn this back into the neighborhood street that it's supposed to be from 31 all the way out to Van Ortway. And I don't, I don't necessarily okay. like the idea of people parking on the south side and egressing into traffic to cross to get to, you know, it's a trucking route. Hmm. No, but that, I mean, that's that's kind of where my head was at, is if, if to your point, Southside does get redeveloped, all we're doing then is increasing the demand of people to go to that area and people to cross the street, probably not at a crosswalk, where we're making it a, f a higher throughput street. So to me, that just screams we better keep parking on the north side for the north side businesses. But we, we should back up a second and get kind of consensus on the depressed curb. I think we're forcing controlled entrances and controlled driveways in an area where it doesn't apply. And that, we need to kind of solve that or come to consensus on that. Do we want 200 feet of depressed curb like it is today? Um, and then adjust the parking around that because the way the proposal with with these various curbs and driving down the sidewalk doesn't make sense and i think we need to solve that problem first or come to consensus and then we could figure out where do we stand with this i, I, I agree if you go with all the pressed curb you solve the parking issue because well, then you're just saying mm -hmm. that you can park yeah. anywhere you want to. and I, I know you said that you were trying to model it after what you did on on first right this is right different. but but it's a different it's a different animal I and mean, you have businesses that are fronting right there so, I mean, I, I agree with Nick. I think it's, if it's working and we can engineer around that, I don't understand why we shouldn't. And if we want to break it up just so it's not 200 feet, then put the island, like you said, where the pole is, and that's a parking spot. It'd be one parking spot right in front of the pole, and then you actually gain, because then you wouldn't uh, prohibit anybody from pulling in. You can't, you can't do that unless you're gonna go with keeping you don't. You, I wouldn't go with alternate A just for the sake of one parking spot in front of the pole and make mm -hmm. the rest of it depressed and open. You might as well go with alternate B at that point and just leave it all depressed and open. Right. If you want to do an island there, that's fine, but you won't have a parking space and an island and alternate B and mm -hmm. depressed curb. You, you won't have it all. Okay. It, it will look like alternate. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> yeah. It will look like alternate B with depressed curve all the way. Right. Because this way we have enough in front of the businesses that they can park and they will not overhang on top of the sidewalk. Well, and I'd also like to see the businesses, especially everything west of Ollie's, have striped spots. If we're going to do this, I think that that has to be something that's marked out there because I constantly see it, especially if I'm out walking dogs going by there. There's cars, one, not only parked across the sidewalk now, but all over the place out there. I mean, the one picture we've got is shows the pickup truck sideways across the... If you know, we are five. designating these now as parking spaces, that does raise an issue we thought of this afternoon. At least one of them is going to have to be a handicapped space. Right, and that's something else I was going to ask. Is that's it requirement? Will we ask for a requirement for a parking space to be dedicated handicapped? You have to if you're right. going to do this. Yeah. And then that takes up more than one space. Well, do, do we, Gary? I mean, that's is is street improvement going to designate? what somebody has to do on their private property? Private property, parking lots, anything less than 25 spaces by state law has to have a handicap space. Required to have a handicap space. Even though he's not making any, any improvements to his own property? They should be having handicap spaces today. Yeah. Well, sure, they, okay, everybody in town should have them then too. But. Absolutely, you should. That's, that's so that would be a requirement that would have to happen? Yes. Why does it? I, I don't understand why it has to happen. So, but he's not doing, like, Dave said he's not doing anything to his property. It doesn't matter. Businesses should be having, somebody could go there and litigate tomorrow and say you need, you're not providing a handicapped space and they could lose. So you could say that and we could all understand that, but if he doesn't do it, that's out of the city's control. No, because we, have, we are enforcing the state 
accessibility code for the state as part of our requirements as well. Wouldn't the handicap space be regardless of whether or not yes. what option we go? So <coughs> we're going to have to have <coughs> a, mm -hmm. today. Right. right. So so that really but maybe it's really already matter. there. It has no point in our decision making tonight. Right. As far as if it needs That's to be there, to it's going to be there no matter what, well, if I, under that thinking. I think that we should get back to what we originally right. have to do right. here. We have to decide do we want a depressed curb all along there and allow the parking to be all the way across the face of every building there yes. as it is now, just with an improved roadway out in front of it. Yes. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> so, so can I just ask, just with the, the handicap parking, I don't mean to, to stay on it, but does that mean every building has to have a handicap spot? If they have or parking, each parking building is required to have a handicap space, yes. So that means that in your design for the street, you have to, you have to design it and engineer it so that the proper percentage of slope is allowable to, in order for him to put a handicap spot in his parking lot after you put the new road in. <laughs> because if you're, if you're going to change the elevation of the curb, rebuild the elevation of the curb, you can't prohibit him from putting in that handicap spot, according to ADA. He, he has to, if needed, he has to rebuild that area of the parking lot to make it 2%. Yes, you are correct. But if there's, but if you, I'm just saying, and for instance, if you put the curb in six inches lower than what allows for that 2% to work, you're prohibiting him from doing that. So you have to take that into consideration when you engineer the road. But Most like we're meeting at the right of way line. So we're meeting we're matching at the existing. So okay, so if the, so if, if you're matching the existing and he can't meet the two percent matching the existing from his his building, how can you say he has to put in an ADA? We're getting way off subject, but <laughs> there, there there are some there are some provisions for existing grade also. You know that if there's if there's some existing grade situations that per, that preclude them from meeting the exact letter of that, you know you'd still have to have the handicap space, but you could you know have some deviations from that grade percentage. Back to the subject at hand: depressed curb or no depressed curb? Depressed. 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 I think Susan. Okay, I'm still waiting. Wait one more hand. Uh, you're on. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, what we've always talked about is putting in sidewalks and curbs everywhere. And so, the last time this came in front of staff, we looked at this in terms of not parking, pulling in the way it has been for years. So, why are we backpedaling? We're backpedaling for 200 feet for these businesses because it makes sense. I don't think we're backpedaling because I think that's the reason why we recognize that right. the I situation agree. is what it is. So we said this is what we wanted it looked at. So I don't think it's so much as a backpedaling as a recognizing the unique characteristics of that area. Nicely said. I, I agree with you. I mean, I can remember when we went through the streetscape plan and we had Altamano in here and we talked about streetscape and when we looked at Batavia Avenue and all the wide open curb there there is and pavement and everything else, the first thing you learn in ADA or in, in streetscape 101 is to get rid of all this mass pavement and put in specific curb cuts. But yet, at the same time, I think you have to look at every property individually to see whether or not it makes sense. Agree. And I think Alderman Brown, that's ultimately why we're circling back here tonight. Because <laughs> staff follows the direction from those discussions related to Fiscape, staff follows the direction from those discussions related to First Street. Staff has heard time and time again how maybe the aesthetics of South River Street aren't the greatest and we want to clean up South River Street one day to get all those entrances. All right. And so yeah, we have Basically, you know, the option before you now, and I think it, it, and all, uh, Nick, Nick did a good job, and it's basically depressed curb or no depressed curb. If you go with all depressed curb, you've solved the traffic or the parking problem because you're just going to allow them to park there. And, and that's, I mean, that, that, that then solves the issue. I mean, that, that's the end of the direction. Yeah, and I guess I don't have a problem with that. I, I think the opportunity then comes when we get to the other side of the street to try to create that hardscape, streetscape, keep the cars away from the people on the sidewalk area. 
and right now there is no sidewalk over there and it's really dangerous to try to make your way from the elms back into town on that side of the street yeah, I, th I think that's why as a maintaining the same vision as a whole keeping the south side the same with no parking there and those those businesses on the south side of the road do not have this type of parking situation mm -hmm. they are satisfied by one entrance or two entrances and they can have all the parking without losing any parking they would actually have more defined parking which would be understandable but they would on the <coughs> north side is completely left with <coughs> the unique challenge mm -hmm. alan isn't there a crosswalk right by the elms to cross to the north here's the mic lucy can hear isn't there a crosswalk right by the elms yes it is at um, uh, whipple street Okay. It does come across to the sidewalk that's on the north side of the street, but there are no south sidewalks on the south side of the street from Harrison to Whipple. Will the reconstruction of Main Street include sidewalk on the south side of Main Street all the way out to the limits? Yes. The project. <coughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. So will we also make, if we're going to do curb cuts, make all these businesses put in? Are they going to stripe it for handicap parking? Or is the project going to do that? So right now we would re-meet re at the right-of-way. And that, so we will repave. you got alternate B on the screen there. So we'll put in a carriage walk and asphalt up to meeting at the right-of-way grade. And that's the limit of our project. That's the limit. And then we're going to tell the businesses they have to stripe their property. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense to stripe it. That that will give a visual clue to mm -hmm. pedestrians and anybody yeah. out there that it's a parking spot and somebody might back in or out of those spots. <coughs> it's, it's a small improvement that <coughs> business owners can probably make. It's it's pretty inexpensive. Alan, why don't you take a vote? I, I think uh, at this point, then, we should probably vote on this. That, I guess... I'll go ahead and make the motion so we get it Isn't this right. Discussion? <laughs> um, that we would approve uh, alternate B, B with a uh, depressed curb in the area on the 700 block that we've identified in front of 709, 711, and 715. In, in, in that case, I would uh, probably suggest that we get rid of this loading, unloading area because it's going to be all depressed anyway. Mm -hmm. And and it's kind of in the middle of the intersection. It was not our preferred parking spot. So we'd probably get rid of that too. Mm -hmm. Right, I think that's probably safer too if they're backing a well, truck in and going depressed. into the property. You have utility poles there? Right. So it's right. not depressed there now. So Right, there is a, right. a green there's strip a right there. Right yeah, there's a green strip right, so right they there. They don't come in that far over. Right, but Anyway, that may be, it looks like it's... Uh, landscape yep. so that there. last so you could leave that the way it is right I don't, right. you're not going to depress more than what you need but it's right. kind of at the intersection too so if you're making a turn over here it's kind of on your vision so really not supposed to have a parking space in the center of it in the center, center of the intersection <laughs> it's kind of why we were yeah we were we were kind of hesitant to yeah. do that but we showed the it loading area we a, yeah loading area david do you want to come up here and say anything about that no that's good <laughs> Okay, so there's a motion and a second on the floor. Mm -hmm. <coughs> By somebody. Roll yeah. call. Was this motion to re also including removing the loading area? Or re remove, remove the loading area. Remove the loading area. Okay. As well. And, and so that we clear, there will be an island around that pole, depending on where the pole lands. Okay. Five feet on both sides, total probably 10 feet. We'll just... Put an so island for both of those poles that are in that block in that section. Well, you don't. I don't think you need to go just, to the, to just, the no. east. 
Right. Okay. This, that this one would have a, a small island around it. Mm -hmm. And on the other one, you see it's grass already. So but this one will have an island. Once you get past the pole, then you'd start the depressed curve. Okay. So we'll have a transition to B612 curve and then transition down again to depressed curve. Okay. Just to save, yeah. Yeah. save that. Yeah, it'll, it'll be small because the sidewalk is there meeting all the ADA grades, so it's not going to be much of an island, but we're going to try to create something just to protect the pole more, so that people mm -hmm. feel something that, you know, they're going to walk. They're going to stop <laughs> before they hit it. it. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. <clears throat> Wolf? Aye. Salvani? Aye. Brown? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Callahan? Aye. Meitzler? Aye. Malay absent. Ewer? Aye. Cerrone? Aye. McFadden? Aye. Rosado? Aye. ATAC? Aye. Stop. <coughs> Aye. And transit absent. Motion carried. Okay, there we go. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, resolution. Item number eight, resolution 18 14, authorizing preliminary engineering supplement. Number one for Prairie Street reconstruction with Crawford, Murphy, and Tilly for an amount not to exceed $137,286.54. Alderman Wolf. Um, just a little background on this. This is from earlier in 2017. Uh, we approved preliminary engineering contract with Crawford, Mur Murphy, and Tilly for Prairie Street reconstruction, phase one preliminary engineering. Um, it did not include <coughs> the uh, analysis with the traffic with the uh, railroad crossings, so now we have to add that in. Yeah, we, we, we kind of had a presentation on that a um, few months ago um, where we presented <coughs> that um, IDOT is requiring us to coordinate with BNSF and also they're asking us to include the intersection analysis um, into that uh, preliminary design. Uh, we checked with them again ask them, can we not do that because it's adding time and money to the project? Um, they um, <laughs> said, no, you have to do it. So we are just doing the preliminary engineering for that BNSF crossing and signal design and, and intersection analysis. But we can tell at the end of the report what we want to improve. And we kind of talked about there are two sections of this project or two parts of this project. One is the intersection plus railroad, another is railroad to south all the way to Pine Street. So we can decide on that. We don't have to decide on that today. We'll probably bring it back to you, the, the draft report to you, show you what our cost estimate gonna look like for those two parts, and then at that time we can decide. And also there are opportunities to um, apply for some grant funding with BNSF or ICC uh, for, for um, putting the gates and all those stuff. So, so we'll, we'll look into those opportunities too and, and make that decision towards the end of this year, not now. But at, at this time, what is in front of you is that um, approve that uh, supplement to that contract to CMT so that they can do the railroad um, analysis and intersection analysis and, and uh, proceed forward with the preliminary engineering. That's what's in front of you. So we're looking at another $137,000. Yeah, the, this addition to it, what was the engineering amount from the last original? Um, it was um, $237,000 and some change, if I remember correctly. So over half, again, $400,000. For this part. Yeah, the railroad kind of makes you do a lot of things. <laughs> and, and it's a kind of complicated railroad um, analysis, too, because it crosses not, not only... Um, um, Prairie, it also crosses Wilson. So you kind of have to, if you do a signal design, you have to do it in such a way that the gate that Wilson comes down and Prairie comes down and all the stuff. Scott. Just, just a, a, a building on that, had we known uh, that we needed to include this with, that, with the original engineering, would that have cut that cost down? No, I don't think so. Um, because they haven't done anything extra. Really? Okay. I mean, we kind of just shifted or told them that just proceed forward that you you had this scope in the in the original 
Um, I'm just saying. I'm, there was a question just for future with with different crossings that we know that we have to include that so we don't come back and all of a sudden get another 137,000 thrown at us. Um, no, I don't. I, okay. I mean, it's kind of like I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. They kind of they kind of started doing this, so they have an idea how much time they have already spent. So we kind of like shifted the money, if you want to say that they were forced to do some of this work already. But we said, ah, you didn't have that in the scope, but proceed forward. We want to find out what we really need to do. So, so it's based on some uh, original numbers that they have spent, or hours they have spent, and some, some are estimated too. And they get paid on um, whatever they, hour they spend. So it's a cost plus fixed fee. So they, they don't get paid on, like, it's a contract, 137, and you get a check. It's like they have to provide us all the hours and, and, right. and time sheets and everything, so. Okay. Dave. Um, is this gonna, have, having to do this engineering, is this gonna put any delay into the project itself as the mayor's expressed, you know, we've only got so much time here where that grant is possibly available before it is in jeopardy? So that, so that we uh, don't get a lot of delays, that's why I kind of propose that we use MFT money. So we actually tag some MFT, our, our local, Look, state MFT money for the resurfacing program. So I'm proposing that we shift some of that money, $137,000, to this because that's a very fast um, approval process. IDOT has already talked about it, you know, and, and once it goes to the council, we send it to them and they approve it in a week. If we, ha if we would have used the grant money, that would probably add another six months to the whole process. So that's why we kind of kind of using a different source of money, um, not impacting the budget at all. So it's overall it's a net sum. So so will it add? Yes, it will add some time. But we are still hoping that by end of this year we'll get a phase one approval, and phase two will be pretty straightforward. It's not more than probably nine to twelve months process. So to 2019, no 2020. January is when we are hoping that we are going to go into letting, so construction in March, starting construction in March. Alderman Brown, to further answer your question, when this was first proposed by the previous city engineer, it was from south of the railroad track south to Pine Street. Okay, and then the project went forward, and that's why we, our original scope was that. And then when we first brought it to the state and to the FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, who oversees some of the funding, that's when they said, what are you doing? You need to go all the way to Wilson Street. You need to include the railroad. We came to council with that. Council basically gave us the direction that we'd rather not study that intersection. We'd rather just go south of the railroad. So we went back to the feds again and asked again a second time. And they basically said, kind of in no uncertain terms, you got to study it. You don't have to build it, but you got to study it. So to answer your question about quickness, I mean, we can continue to fight that fight or we can study it and just move forward. So, I mean, this is the quickest path forward. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Anybody care to make a motion on resolution 18-14-R? So moved. Second. Motion by Cerrone, second by Ewer. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank Con you. Consent agenda? Sure. Okay. Item number nine, resolution 18-15-R, authorizing the mayor to execute a petition to the ICC for installation of a new railroad spur crossing on Hubbard Avenue. Alderman Wolf. Okay. Your tractor. Hold on a second. All right. City staff has been working with Suncast on a project to construct a new rail spur uh, that will serve, serve new manufacturing at their expanded Suncast Lane facility. Um, the spur is proposed to be constructed at the same time as the old spur was partially that was partially removed three to five years ago. And that's the background on it. And so this is really a new old spur um, <laughs> that will be completely funded, constructed, maintained, administered by Suncast in combination with BNSF. Um, that being said, the public entity who owns the roadway, being us, we have to want make the petition or the contact with the ICC. So I, I indicated in my memo that some of the terms and conditions may have to change 
um, based on what the ICC ultimately rules. And Attorney Drendel kind of let us know that. But at this time, uh, com we're comfortable moving forward with the document that was presented. Um, and then this would basically enable um, us, the city, using all the documents provided by Suncast, to make a submittal to ICC to request that the crossing go in. And I'll make it clear to everyone that we're not paying for the crossing. We're not paying to maintain the crossing. We're not paying for anything. Um, ultimately, that's all Suncast responsibility. All we have to do is get permission for it from the ICC. Anybody have any questions? Uh, when the train, I'm assuming it'll be early morning when it goes through the crossing. Uh, Suncast runs trains at odd times throughout the day, so not necessarily in early morning. Will the train be sounding the horn? Um, 10 miles an hour, and I'm going to just say yes to say conservative. I, I, I don't know that this would be a quiet crossing because that's not what is being proposed right now. Right. Yeah. So and they, they cross, I mean, really they're the user of the track out there, the big user. I mean, being working out there, they cross at all times throughout the day, <coughs> those trains do. Any idea what their schedule is, Gary, when they want to do this? Uh, they would like, and, and ICC has responded back that um, they can get their review done typically in about four to six months at the worst case scenario, hopefully closer to the four months. So they want to get this going this spring. Yeah. Well, I think it's good. It shows commitment from some yeah, case. that they want to stay there. Yeah. All right. Anybody want to make a motion on resolution 18-15-R? <laughs> so moved. Second. Motion by Meitzler, second by Ewer. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Consent? Sure. Okay, item 10, resolution 18-10-R, authorizing purchase of a 2018 John Deere 444 wheel loader from John Deere retail sales for $141,278.71. Alderman Wolf. Okay, um, this is a street division purchase um, of a wheel loader to replace is replacing the 2008 wheel loader. So this is actually a shared purchase. The streets and water and electric divisions all share in the, some of the heavy equipment. Uh, streets division um, always kind of takes the lead on these things. And as we have done in the past, uh, equipment that we feel will have a, a market to the general marketplace, we will place on public surplus. So we've gotten a trade allowance from the vendor and then we'll also place this on, on public surplus. And if we end up getting more through public surplus, we'll sell it that way. If we get less through public surplus, we'll use the trade allowance and sell it that way. Okay. That's great. And with the allowance, even if it at 40 grand, it still comes in less than what we had budgeted, right? It was one Correct. 20. 20. Yep. Mike? Well, I'm going to say uh, this is a heavy duty equipment, it does heavy duty work. And just in the process of what it does, it takes abuse. And so I guess I would have to say kudos to staff that we've maintained 30% of its value, 33% of its value over 10 years, which, I mean, I don't think anybody has done that with their automobiles. <laughs> and so uh, just kudos to staff for maintenance. I guess you keep it on a pretty good maintenance schedule. So I'm sure this is one of the very well used uh, pieces of equipment that gets used all the time. I would imagine. Time. It's yeah. got to be ready to go. All seasons. Okay. We want to make a res uh, motion on resolution 18-10-R. <coughs> I recommend we pass, we recommend city council passage of resolution 18-10-R authorizing to purchase a 2018 John Deere 444 wheel loader for $141,278.71. Second. Motion by O'Brien, second by Silvati. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consent. Sure. Item 11, resolution 18-17-R, authorizing the mayor to execute the application to the IEPA for a low interest loan for storm sewer separation. Alderman Wolf. As part of our efforts to alleviate uh, drainage concerns and sewer backups in Area 3, the City Council authorized WBK Engineering to prepare final engineering plans to separate the storm sewer from the sanitary sewer. Um, the final plans will be bid out in phases to allow for 
construction in the next three to five years. Um, first phase of the separation was completed in November of 2017. The installation of the downstream outfall point at the Fox River next to the West Side Cemetery. Second phase will be to bid the February 2018 construction starting in early spring of 2018. Um, this is uh, an application to the IEPA that the mayor needs to sign. Uh, the result of the low interest loan application will be known in a few months, currently estimated at six to nine months. So city council approved bond funds, general bond funds for drainage improvements. And those bond funds right now are being used in area three and in ward one. Um, for the 2018 construction season, that's how we're going to be using the bond funds is in both of those areas. But in area three, which is the separation, we also would qualify for IEPA loans in order to pay for separation projects. Um, so in order to keep the process going, we'll use bond funds this summer, but then we're planning to apply for EPA loans. And if we get the EPA loans, then we can divert bond funds from area three back over to ward one. So then we can kind of run both at the same time um, doing it that way. So. That's why we're seeking bond funds, oh, I'm sorry. That's why we're seeking the low interest loan through the EPA. And just one kind of item that's out of the ordinary, um, the deadline for this application occurs before the next council meeting. So staff is asking permission, basically if, if you guys approve this tonight and you authorize the mayor to sign it before he gets official authorization at council, that he'd be allowed to sign it, and then you guys would still follow up at the council meeting to give him official authorization. But his signature on the documents would enable us to submit before the deadline. So, everybody understand that? <laughs> okay. We want to make a motion on resolution 18-17-R. So move. Second. Motion by O'Brien. Second by Silvati. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consent agenda? Sure. Okay. <coughs> Item 13 is the discussion on annexing area around Pine Street and South Van Buren Street. Memo from Scott Buning. Alderman Stark, you going to take this? No, you can take it. It's easier <laughs> without me, actually. <laughs> I'm just going to let Scott take these next couple items. Sure. Um, as we've been looking at the um, various annexation of donut holes and, and such, um, we have made some good progress on, on making some uh, uh, progress on, on completely annexing some of these uh, properties that had annexation agreements and uh, utility agreements in the past. And our plan is to come back to you uh, with a full report uh, as to where we are and where we think we should be going. But uh, in the meantime, we found this one area that uh, is a little bit curious because it's completely surrounded in, by the city limits in black. Um, most of the properties are on one or more, if not all, city utilities. So the ones on Van Buren in particular are, are on all city utilities right now, uh, with the exception of one property. Um, there's a number of other properties that are mostly in the city limits, uh, and they have like a strip of land that's outside um, that's similar like the area we did on South Harrison that uh, we had um, properties that were half in and half out, and that was just a function of, frankly, the original city boundary. So um, this north line here is the original city boundary when we were incorporated, actually, and it just happened to split property lines back in that day. So we've made some progress and annexed a few properties around this, but these are kind of the last ones. Our concern is that um, we don't normally provide electric service to anybody outside the city limits. And these are some properties that uh, have been on city electric for some time now. Uh, don't know the circumstances because it's probably been decades that they've been on city electric. But we really, really don't want to have uh, users outside of the city limits on city electric. So our suggestion is to uh, proceed with a letter to these folks uh, asking them to voluntarily annex the property in the city limits and then if we get majority of the property owners to go ahead and proceed with the annexation uh, of this and and to bring it into the city limits again this area is under 60 acres it is allowed to be uh, what's called an involuntary annexation under statute uh, we don't normally do that we did technically do that on the South Harrison area because we had like 70 percent of the property owners agree to annex um, so hopefully we'll get a majority of these folks to agree and then we can proceed with an annexation in that direction so we're just looking for uh, consensus from the council to proceed in that manner Anybody have any comments or questions? 
If we do a, the forced annex on that, what does that cost? Um, in, in that case, we just do a plat of annexation, which is like any of these other annexations we're doing, so that's, you know, a couple hundred dollars. And then we have to do a notice in the newspaper, and then a letter goes out to the individual property owners. So it's, you know, $500 maybe at most. Okay. I talked to Scott about this last week, and, uh, or, yeah, it was last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand what he's trying to do here. I certainly support it. These residents are all using all of our utilities. They're surrounded by our entire, you know, by Batavia. If they have a emergency, they dial 911, even though the sheriff is supposed to support them, Batavia goes there first. If there's a fire or an ambulance call, Batavia goes there. So they're taking advantage of all of our, all of our services. So um, I think it's uh, overdue. Do we know if there's... Fire, they're in the fire protection district, so they are paying for the tax right. for the fire and ambulance. Right. As far as electric goes, though, Mayor, isn't there there's some understanding or something that we're, right. where we're not supposed to allow electric outside or provide electric outside of our boundaries, and in return, ComEd won't mm -hmm. try to come in to our boundaries, right? That's right. That was going to be my question about the electric issue particularly do we know if that's are these the only ones where that scenario is or do we have others we believe that these are the only ones that have that situation sure. yes do you have any idea how they got normal addresses uh, you know that's it, it is that way in several of these unincorporated pockets actually where they have a city style address i mean you can see the other ones in blue there are on pine street also have a city style address um, I think the areas that were closer to the center of town just had them. Um, you know, Whipple, Evergreen, a lot of those areas also have city-style addresses, even though they're unincorporated. So it just depends on, you know, how they were assigned back in the day. Huh. We do know and really assign them a city address if they are a rural address, though, once they're annexed. Right. These won't change, obviously. Okay, so are we in agreement to allow Scott to go ahead and proceed? Yep. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Scott. All right, Scott, you want to take the next one, the discussion on allowing amounts of non-sales tax producing businesses in the GC General District? Yes, we were asked to bring this topic back to the council for uh, some discussion. Uh, essentially, this is the um, com amount of commercial uh, retail, uh, or uh, the maximum amount of um, non-retail allowed in a general commercial district. Um, the council had discussed this back when we made some changes, and we set it at 25%. There was some discussion about whether it should be 30% or what have you. Um, so, you know, we settled on 25%. So then um, the council asked us to bring this forward to discuss whether or not they wanted to change that percentage and make it, uh, you know, less percent that uh, was allowed for non-retail or not. Um, and the action on that is to the discretion of the commission. Come on, committee, sorry. Committee. We're currently at about what percent? Twenty-five percent is the maximum. It, but how much do we have out there now? Uh, I don't know that number offhand. I, I would have to go back and look and see what we we had. We did a survey some time ago, but I don't recall what the number was. What do we think, Susan? You're the one that kind of asked for this to be brought back to committee too. Are you there? I am. Any comments on it? Uh, um. I think that we should leave it where it is. Second. Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> so leave it's, it it's at hard 20, to increase leave it, it at twenty five percent. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I agree with that. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree as well. Okay. End the discussion. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, item number 15, ordinance 18-14, adopting the prevailing wage ordinance, Alderman Atek. Yes, uh, this is um, an item that we look at every year, and um, uh, the, we are required that to make sure that we um, hire uh, laborers for any public works project that meet the prevailing wage that we've established and the last time that we had it established was September 2017 
And um, depending on the economic environment, if there's an unemployment rate greater than 5% for two consecutive calendar months, we need to hire people from the state um, with a few exceptions. So if there aren't any, um, any questions, I, are there any questions? I recommend that we recommend to council the approval of the um, King County prevailing wage. Second. For 2018. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it. <laughs> You're consistent. Okay. Thank you. Um, that cannot go on the consent agenda then since it was a no vote. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alan. <laughs> we usually get that one down to where the mayor has to break the tie on that one. But <laughs> Item number 16, discussion on the 2018 budget. Automatic. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Laura. She has brought to our attention that given the Sam's um, Club closure that we need to look at a budget because um, it's going to have a, a strong impact on our budget this coming year and for years to come perhaps. So as I stated in the memo, um, uh, we received the news as everyone else did on January 11th that Batavia was one of seven different communities in Illinois that was going to experience the closure of their Sam's Club operations. Um, this not only poses a loss of the sales tax revenue that was generated, but also the uh, liquor tax that was generated, the fees that were paid to the utilities, and then also if the property remains vacant, they can take a vacancy reduction on the amount of property taxes that they pay. Um, in all, we estimate at this point that there might be a $800,000 to $1 million loss of revenue for the city, but it can't really be ascertained at this time because certainly there will still be um, those items that residents used to purchase at Sam's Club that they're going to now purchase at other Batavia retailers. However, it could have a negative impact in that um, that Sam's Club drew um, shoppers from other areas into Batavia and they probably frequented other businesses that were located here. So it's going to take some time to really ascertain with any certainty what the true impact um, to our budget is going to be. However, um, I think that we have to be extremely careful this year and it's causing us to have to take another look at what we had budgeted for 2018 to make sure that we have as little impact on our reserves as possible. Um, as an initial matter, two positions that were approved in the 2018 budget, the additional um, police officer who was to serve on the North Central Narcotics Task Force, as well as the additional position in um, the Community Development Department, which was a combined um, code enforcement uh, building inspector position meant to supplement their overtaxed staff due to all of the development projects that we have um, coming online. In our discussions, I know that both from a staff perspective as well as uh, unanimous, unanimously among the, the city council members, we thought those were two very important positions. However, adding to our staff is a <coughs> commitment long into the future and should not be taken lightly and in light of um, having to um, adjust to the impact of uh, on our revenue that's, that's so significant, we want to make sure that we're going to be able to identify the funding source if we're going to be able to establish those positions. So, Ideally, we want our budget to um, maintain the financial support for the level of services that we identified in our 2018 budget. Um, and we also want to, uh, it would be easy to say that we're just going to lengthen out our maintenance and <clears throat> replacement schedules into the future, but there's a danger to that as well, that um, if things aren't uh, replaced in the time in which is the normal life of that equipment, we may end up 
um, replacing that in an emergency situation or that it caused damages or, or other higher costs. Also, if we keep um, delaying the, the replacement, um, it ends up in higher long-term costs, um, thinking of maintenance projects. We know that over time, the construction materials and labor costs we can pretty much judge are going to increase in the future. However, that being said, um, we are going to recommend delaying some of the action on things that we planned to do this year so that we can minimize the impact to our 2018 budget. So the budget impact, if we were not to fill those two identified positions for this year, would provide a savings of $229,000. That's reflective of the salary and benefits, but also there was to be a vehicle purchased for the additional community development position. We are also suggesting um, in light of the fact that we had already deferred until about mid-year to decide whether or not to proceed with the City Hall remodeling project. Um, part of that would have uh, been a transfer from the general fund um, to the City Hall capital fund of $200,000. Um, in addition, I asked the department heads to uh, meet with their individual groups and to come up with some perhaps quick low-hanging fruit of cost savings that we could look at this year. And um, so some of the actions that have been taken is to eliminate all out-of-state travel at this point. Um, we learned earlier this year that Tricom overestimated our 2018 fee by an amount of $30,000. Um, we're going to return to the five-year payment plan on our tasers that were purchased. We had initially thought that just spending $16,000 this year or, I'm sorry, uh, 23000 this year. <coughs> would um, we'd be instead of dragging it out over the course of five years, but um, by returning to the five year payment plan, that's a savings of 16,000. Um, the fire department is going to delay its equipment replacement. It feels that it can safely do that for a cost savings of $25,000 over the next five years. We're going to eliminate the recently reinstituted tuition reimbursement program that was funded at $20,000. Uh, we have an employee recognition banquet. Every other year, it's a um, dinner, and the employee's spouse is invited to that. And then the other years, we have a pancake breakfast. So since last year we had the pancake breakfast, we had planned on the dinner employee, the employee recognition dinner this year. We're going to roll that back to be the pancake breakfast again, and that's a cost savings of $5,000. Uh, delaying the purchase of furniture for the police department at $4,000 eliminate the increase in uh, professional services for economic development, saved $8,000. Eliminating the bridge surveillance equipment was uh, saving us $3,000. Eliminating the summer intern for community development saves $5,000. Delaying the purchase of a police department administrative vehicle saves $25,000 and canceling the police department Lexapol subscription, which had originally been planned for later in 2018 for $4,000. So together, these adjustments um, amount to an additional $147,000. And when combined with the savings from waiting to hire the um, positions and also um, eliminating the transfer to the City Hall Capital Fund result in a total uh, savings for this year of $576,000. So um, what we would like to do is take some time to realize what the actual financial impact will be of the loss of the Sam's Club revenue, as well as um, uh, we have meetings scheduled with the Sam's Club real estate department to, so that we can ascertain what their future plans for that property are. And as well, I think we want to have, uh, once we determine what that shortfall might be, to have communications 
within the organization down to the level of the employees who are doing the work, who are in the best position to identify if there's potential savings to be made, but also perhaps community discussions as well um, to, to seek their input as to how to solve these issues also. Um, so I guess what we're asking for is just some time and that uh, today we are asking that you direct us to conduct a study of the financial impact of the Sam's Club closing <clears throat> and to create a specific action plan identifying potential expense reductions and uh, revenue increases for the 2019 budget and beyond that are aimed at maintaining to the greatest extent possible the levels of service committed to in the 2018 budget. <coughs> Or when you say conduct a study, are you talking do it in house or hire a study? Conduct it in house. Great Marty. job, Laura. Oh, the the proactive uh, actions by the whole staff is great. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, um, I just want to kind of reiterate that. I know we talked privately about it, but I really appreciate the um, recognition of the gravity of the situation, um, acting proactively on it and realistically while at the same time being optimistic about it because while this is a throat punch we can't lose sight of all the other things that we have momentum on that this is more of a setback than anything else and I think like you had said some of the impact that we have we're losing out of that location mm -hmm. but we have an opportunity for other locations in town for that money to be spent so that it's not necessarily a it's a loss for that location but it's an opportunity for other locations coupled with the fact that we have some very long time standing vacant buildings that are being filled dollar tree sierra trading um, <coughs> The, um, the burrito furniture. place, the, the furniture place, the burrito place where the White Castle used to be. Mm -hmm. Taken on an individual basis, they chip away, but collectively that offsets a lot of the pain with the reasonable cuts then shifting that we're trying to do. So like I had said previously and privately, thank you very much. Mm. Uh, Marty? I mean, I'm sorry, Mike? Chief, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but... Uh, Use the mic, please, Mike. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but with the, the, the task force, you know, we had a gentleman come before us last week saying that there are deaths happening in Batavia. Was, uh, are you, we feeling that we're not going to be covering are you being put at a loss? Laura and I have spoken about this decision. I think it's prudent and wise at this point considering this unexpected loss in tax revenue. Um, we've initiated some movement inside the organization. We're meeting with, we're gonna try to attack this in a different way. Um, we're meeting with the uh, special agent in charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration on Thursday and the uh, task force commander um, of the Major Crimes Task Force in Kane County. Uh, we're gonna try to attract this, or attack this not necessarily from um, a proactive, but maybe a reactive uh, standpoint from the investigative side. Uh, they are trying to form a heroin task force that we were, we're going to try to become part of. So it would be post-event, but it might actually strike closer to the, the heart of the problem. So I feel like this is, a, this is the right decision to make at this time. Right. Thank you. Mark? So, yeah, kudos on, on all the efforts to try and reduce this impact. Uh, one of the things I was curious about, um, as I sat on council last year and I watched one project after another come in hey under budget under budget under budget how does that play into this do we do we have those figures yet um we don't have those figures yet but it um it, it's a point that we've been making throughout the organization is basically as you approach a purchase this year ask yourself three times if is that a purchase that needs to be made is it does it need to be purchased now and can it be purchased for possibly less we're going to push on every one of our um, providers and contractors to try <coughs> to provide the quality we're looking for but for the lowest price possible i've got some 
other feelings, I guess, than what we're hearing here tonight are, then I would agree that I appreciate the staff taking pause on this. Um, but yet, I don't want to lose fact, lose track of the fact that a lot of, we don't, we don't know the impact. We don't know how much of the Sam's Club business is going to relate to the other businesses in town. The liquor business, is it going to go to the liquor stores, you know, all this kind of stuff. We don't know that. We can guess, but we don't know. But what, I, what I'm concerned about is the chief just spoke to one of the, my concerns is, is that going to really affect what he needs to try to do? But, you know, something as minor as a $5,000 intern for community development, um, we're going to cut out. And we, we heard not long ago, and we were all appalled as to how long it takes to get an inspection in the city of Batavia. And we, we just said that that's unacceptable. And we all are in favor of economic development. And we all heard how we need somebody in economic, in the community development department, and we approved it. Um, now, you know, I, I understand, you know, the personnel is the biggest expense of the city of Batavia. I, I understand that. And again, I appreciate taking pause. But we've heard all these new developments, and we just got word today of another one. And what are these developers going to do when they come into town and they say, how long is it going to take to get approvals? How long is it going to take to get inspections? And they get told the reality. Are we chasing away our economic development? So are we being in, what's the old saying, penny wise and dollar short or whatever the heck it is? I don't, I don't remember what it is, but dollar foolish. I just, you know, if the chief thinks he can handle what we were going to hire that police officer for, that's great. I, I don't know if Scott thinks he can handle everything, and Chris, if they think they can handle everything without getting it. Obviously, they do, because they've, they've talked with Laura. But as the guy sitting here today that's trying to represent our city and to try to make sure that things go along well in cutting back on the personnel that we were going to hire, how are we going to get inspections done any sooner than what we said is unacceptable? How are we not? How are we going to not chase businesses away and development away if we're allowing it to be unacceptable? That's my concern. Dave, Marty. So the um, uh, summer intern one for five thousand dollars for in community development that would give better benefit. That's. Uh, our pay for two meetings. If we voluntarily gave that up, two meetings, we could fund that position. That's a bigger picture than that. I, I, I realize that, but it's trying to also chip away and figure out creative different ways that we can do what we could do. Smaller things coupled with the larger things have to be the way we're actually approaching this, which is, I think, well, again, the though, Marty, I, is I, we, we don't know the impact. I, and I'm not, I'm I not know. arguing over I know. donating a couple meetings. No, 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 I, I care less. I, just, I know that. Are we overreact to something that we don't know the baseline? I think that that point is absolutely why I appreciate the optimism of looking at all of this not as pessimism and fear, fear panic cuts, that we're trying to anticipate the best we can conservatively while still trying to remain optimistic about where the opportunities to make sure we don't leak business. Chief, you have something? Holman Brown, if I could add something to this. Um, our discussions, and I, I think Scott would probably agree, um, they didn't indicate these positions were cut, they are put on hold. And yeah. I think, you know, that's where we're in agreement that, you know, what we're doing is put placing a pause on this until we can determine, uh, at, a, at a date to be determined yet, what the actual impact of this yeah. loss is. Yeah. That, and and that's, that's a good point, Chief, but I, I was going to ask that question, so I'm glad you just reminded me of it. How long do we think it's going to take? Because, I mean, we're not going to know the effects, Peggy, from, from our loss in, in sales tax until a good year or two down the road. No. We'll be able to see a big hole immediately after 
three months have gone by. Right. We won't we won't get the information from the state for some time, but we'll be able to tell how much our sales tax has dropped. Well, based it on really a year doesn't to year matter why. We'll, or something. We'll, we'll know it, what the amount is that we're getting compared to what we projected we were going to get. Mm -hmm. can, can we also be strategic in, in just monitoring those those different areas where we might see you know kind of transferred purchase, whether it's liquor stores or you know or you know maybe it's to just to Walmart or to wherever, uh, because I I think to, to the point of we do need to downshift just to be cautious because. You just don't know because it could very well be a lot of those dollars just get moved around. Uh, but we have we have to be watching it and see where it goes, and then maybe we can, you know, kind of just, you know press the accelerator a little bit more. Yeah, and don't forget they just sold their entire inventory so a lot faster than they normally would. So that impact may be a ten month or a nine month impact instead of a twelve month impact because of the fact that they sold all that. Right, so not including January sales after that. We'll yeah. start to see. We don't know how quickly they turn their inventory over and that they yeah. restock their shelves, so we really don't know if selling all of that inventory is a, is a two-month or three-month or, or one-month. Yeah, it's a delay, but there are also a significant reduction. You know, 25%, I think it'll be 50% at one point. Something. Mm -hmm. it, it'll be a significant <laughs> loss, but your point is... Well, yeah, you got to wait. There'll right. be a little hiccup there for us. Do we, do we know what the state is going to do with the LGDF? No, there hasn't been any discussion of that recently. So, I don't know if the mayor other, has. Other than the 10% uh, reduction in the LDF that is a result of the different way that they're paying it out now. Which is just a different way of them saying they're keeping another 10% right. of our money. <laughs> right. Nothing else is going to change with the LGDF until after the election. What could change is that in the current Supreme Court term, that they are hearing a case um, that is about the ability of states and um, municipalities to collect sales tax on online purchases based upon where the customer lives. And that would be very interesting. It's a case out of um, South Dakota, but a lot of states, including the state of Illinois, are watching this case very closely. I had a conversation last week with Christina Castro. She's a Illinois senator, and she has already proposed legislation um, that is a Marketplace Fairness Act, is what it's called. And um, just Illinois is just waiting to see what the results of that South Dakota case are. And that would allow us to collect our local share of taxes on internet sales, which I think should be something that everyone can get behind because it would be an additional source of revenue for across the country us to face our infrastructure issues that we're facing. So. There's another thing that I'm optimistic about. And that decision should come as soon as June 2018, according to the news stories about it. Well, I'm, I'm willing to give it some time here to see how it all, how the dust settles. But I think we can't ignore the fact of the conversations we had before the bud during the budget of the need for the two people that we approved the hiring of. And if it comes down to in three months, it's determined that it's had a drastic impact on us, then I think we need to, in executive session, discuss the need of personnel, period. The existing personnel and the need of, of future personnel. I think one thing that we have to keep in mind is that um, drastic cuts were made as a result of the, the Great Recession. and. The staff certainly is not even back up to the levels that it was prior to um, those 2010 cuts. And I think that staff have tried over the course of those intervening years to make an analysis on a year-by-year -year basis as to which positions were a priority at the time. So just to keep that in mind as we approach that discussion. Yeah. 
Okay, so do you, do you need anything from us on this? No, other than I'm, I'm sensing that you're, you're asking us to study and come back with a more specific action plan. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, then we're going to go on to item 17, resolution 18-13R, approving a new rate for general legal services with Drendel <coughs> and Jensen Law Group. Alderman Atek. Yes, um, after seven years, excuse me, they are looking for an hourly increase of um, on the, going from $175 to $190, which is an 8.75% increase. Do they get some sort of a retainer? I can't remember. No, they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. It's always hourly. <coughs> it's always hourly for the general legal services. We pay a set amount for their um, representation on prosecutions. Okay. And what is that? Um, that's for, from the police department. Okay. All right. Are there any questions? And a lot of that, when they do uh, annexation agreements and such, that all is paid for by the petitioner. Correct? For the record. Right. Okay. And that's actually at a different rate, I believe. Right. I think that's what I read out of the memo is that, that the pass-through is a different rate than the general legal services rate that we pay here. Right. Yes. They, they pay a non-municipal rate, essentially. Yeah. When would this take effect? I, I don't know. January, January 1st. 1st. So it would be retro. Yes. Mm -hmm. So just a question of... You know, this came to us October 4th, and it's January 23rd. What what took so long? I what didn't realize that uh, we needed to pass a resolution. Kevin brought it to my attention. <laughs> so what were you going to do? Just, just approve it? Yeah, I just thought as an operating expense, it was, seemed like a very reasonable increase mm -hmm. in amount, so... Um, but luckily, we have great re legal representation that allowed me to correct my mistake. <laughs> Elliot? We are lucky. Is there, this is all percentages and, and hourly. What is the forecast? What, what's the impact on the budget? That was where my question mm -hmm. was. Yeah. Because it came in in October, we were able to consider that. Okay. What is the impact <laughs> from an hour standpoint? But, How many hours do they do in a year typically? So what will this increase mean? $10,000, $20,000? Uh, um, it's impossible to predict because I cannot... Uh, predict how many right, but legal issues. Can you so look in back the in the last three years and determine how many hours they've... It would be they've under 10,000. I think that the estimate would be about 7,800. 7,800. Thanks. Anyone else? Marty? Yeah, I was just going to, in light of the previous conversation, the justification for the 175 to 190 being an 8.5%, and I realize it hasn't been over the years, what is that comparable to? Or how did we determine, how was the 190 determined? Um, I, you know, I, I guess I can speak to that having been an attorney, that this is a, a very reasonable amount to be charged on an hourly basis. Well, in my industry, I'm looking at attorney fees for, you know, 675 an hour, but, <laughs> but that's also different than mm -hmm. what we're doing. So right. on a... I mean, obviously, and we're not going to pay the 675 rate that I have to deal with. However, is it comparable to the surrounding area? Absolutely, okay. because I'm familiar with that, too. And general legal representation at a Fox Valley firm, this is still low. Right. Any other questions? All right. Would someone like to make a motion? To recommend to council resolution number 18-13-R approving a new rate for legal general legal services with Drendel and Jansen's law group. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Susan, do we still have you? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. All right. Consent agenda, Lucy? Yes. All right. Item number 18, discussion on the selection of a consultant to assist with the City of Batavia's strategic plan. <coughs> Alderman Atek. All right. Um, as we talked about last fall, um, 
some of us met um, with staff to uh, interview some strategic planning consultants. And uh, we eliminated um, all but two. And given our new um, budget situation, staff is recommending that we go with Housel Levine and Associates um, uh, for a cost of $39,912.50. And, you know, both outfits were very good. Future IQ was a little more um, maybe innovative, but um, it's hard to justify that extra, what, 35,000 uh, in this um, environment. Are there any questions? Not a question, just a comment. When I was reading through all this stuff before when you sent it, that I wasn't necessarily comfortable with Future IQ just because of the distance anyway, mm -hmm. that it wasn't Local, I didn't know that it was going to be right fit for us. And Housel Levine has worked with dozens of northern yeah. Illinois municipalities. Scott Buning has worked with John Housel before on uh, planning projects and has, was very satisfied with the, the quality of the Good. results that he received. Mm -hmm. um, and I was impressed that the organizations I contacted with Housel Levine both felt very well attended to in the process, but that it didn't just end once they had their strategic plan, that that was a document that they, they kept in touch with Housel Levine. It was a living document. They were using it. They were implementing it. So I know that that's something that's very, very important to all of us in this process, staff and council alike. Right. Um, Mike. I'm, I'm sure they're quite impressive. What are they going to do for us? Well, they are facilitators in the strategic, strategic planning process, and they have the background to help <coughs> groups like us that don't do strategic planning on a regular basis, which is so important to what we do, um, come together and come up with a plan and a direction for the city. All right. And so what did we do last year? We've been hobbling along. No, we didn't no, use strategic we planning last what, what, year. What, what, what oh, did that she, didn't, she didn't. Something happened. <laughs> yeah. she, Mike, you're talking she completely about dropped the ball. Yeah. Rebranding. No, 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 no. no. Oh, no. It was a woman I didn't participate, mm -hmm. and I won't participate in this, I don't believe. I, for I one hope, thing, we have a budget issue. I hope issue. you do. Well, we have a budget issue. Well, that's a okay. good point. You know, that's a big issue, I believe. Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking to cut costs. We had a woman do something on Saturdays, <laughs> and we never got anything from it. No, I, I just, I just, this will be my third that I've been going through. We've paid taxpayer dollars for these things and got nothing from it. Now, we had Dr. Gabris the first time. That was seven years ago. Got nothing out of it. The guy just talked. And I don't know what happened last year, but we didn't get anything out of that either. And so I know everyone's going to say, oh, but this is really important. I, I, I don't know. I, you, know, and I, you know, I'd like to follow up on a strategic plan. I, I know you're, you're, you're really antsy for that, and, and, and I think it's not a bad idea, but right now it's not a good time. So well, I'm, I'm a no I, just, I think strategic planning is more important now than ever, but your point's well taken. There could be other ways to deal with this other than hiring a facilitator, and not, that's not an ideal way. But if this group was committed to it, I mean, it, I, I going out on a limb. Maybe I, go ahead. Yeah, I think Dave was Dave, Dave has something for Dave. I, I, I'm just I, I, maybe I'm on the same side of the fence as Mike. I can't in no way support this now. Would you come together? Let for, me let me okay. explain my reason why. My reason why is because you're going to have a strategic plan and they're going to try to lead you down the right path, tell you things you need to do. We already know what we need to do in a couple instances. One is hire another police officer and one is hire another community development person. Well, those are really okay? short term so things. So those are things that we need to do that we're not able to do because we don't have the money. Right. So I can't see spending $30,000 on another consultant to tell us what we need to do. Well, I, I think the consultant will help us vision for the future. I mean, Absolutely, not, but we I, don't have $30,000 now to do it. Okay, but we, we, we could, could do it another way, maybe. But, um, I mean, I mean, we could do it. Am I stepping out of line here? It's not ideal, no, but we could do it ourselves up. if we're right. committed. I mean, we could get together, but we'd have to be committed. 
and someone we'd have to no you're yeah. not liking this idea okay and i i understand and i i agree with you to a degree and, and maybe this is an area where we downshift you know but i i i would i would say that doing something similar in my in my everyday life um the fact is that even even if you say hey let's buckle down and let's you know, let's get it we'll, we'll never do it we'll never do it we won't do it well it, it's just it's, <laughs> Raising my hand. <laughs> um, Just a minute, let him. Yeah, so, you can speak in a second. And, and having having interviewed, you know, a, a bunch of these people and talking to these guys, um, there is a process that they bring to the table. It's not just good enough to have a lady come in and and speak or have whomever came in seven years ago and lecture. It, this is this is a uh, an interactive, ongoing process that you, that people have to buy into. Number one. And and then they they have to commit to actually revisiting it, you know, on you know on a specified time period. So um, this isn't someone just coming in and flapping their gums. This is someone coming in to help us get some work done. And you know, there's yeah, we we're we're cash tight, and we, we're going to probably need to downshift. I would say this is something we need to maybe push until we get some clarity as to what our true economic condition is. But I I see it as something, you know, th this this cart should have come before the branding horse, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it just should have, and and I can't speak <coughs> highly enough about having someone come along and help us that is qualified, because we're not, I mean, as far as just the time and availability to be able to do it right. I agree with you. I didn't mean to. All right, Susan. Susan. Um, <coughs> I would have to agree with both Dave and Mike, um, and whoever, I didn't hear after Dave because I actually hung up instead of unmuted, <laughs> but I, I too have been here for the last two strategic planning sessions. The first one was Dr. Gaber, very highly recommended. Uh, City Administration, Northern Illinois University, we sat through several meetings, went through the whole process, and again, I would say it was a waste of time and money. Last year, we spent a day working with another person who came highly recommended, figured out our key strengths and weaknesses and how we all work together as a team. Another day of my life I'll never get back and another waste of money. So even though people talk about strategic planning, it is great to put things down on paper. If we don't follow a strategic plan, we could spend a million dollars on this. So when we talk about could we do it as a group together, in my mind, based on the last two things we spent money on, us spending time together with staff in a room with no facilitator would be just as um, valuable. I think we're all in consensus of whether or not we believe in this or not, the timing is off. I would think this is something that can be tabled for six months until we get understand where we're at but I don't even the people who believe in this say this isn't the right time so I don't uh, um, I don't think we're going to pass this tonight anyways to, to do it can I just ask who believes in strategic planning using like what was it? Yeah, yeah. are there people that don't feel we should be doing strategic planning here clearly there are clearly all right, who no, does not think we, think we should, should be I just doing don't think strategic the value, planning? There's value in the consultants. I All right, but is there anyone here that yes, thinks we should? Yes, I would be committed to I, doing more and, and doing strategic I, I think there's been several of us that have definitely said that doing proper strategic planning would show good long-term results and a clear direction that we're broadcasting out to people. Mm -hmm. But I think those same people, and myself included, as much as I might be excited about getting underway with a better approach at this that's going to be not just a one and done, but somebody who's actually kind of guiding our hand along the way to shape and mold this properly, mm -hmm. 
we're talking about, you know, we have to cut back on a five thousand. No, I agree. Position. I just I, not, I know you do, and, that, I'm and just but I'm wondering. trying to just clarify okay. my point. Um, that you know, I, I think what we're hearing and, and saying in many different ways is that as much as some of us may want to do this, um, we recognize that we're we need to put a, a more proper focus on the more immediate, unfortunately emergent problems. Yeah. Right. I would like to say that the people that we've hired in the past, I think the guy from NIU, we were trying to keep things under control. We were trying to cut back. That was kind of a bare bones hire. And I don't know really how we came up with the last one. So I don't <laughs> think they can be compared to the people that we talked to in this interview process. But anyway, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, I think that you, your answer is when we put this in the budget that it was passed unanimously. It could have been taken out or brought up the last time by anybody, but I remember specifically that it did come up and we said we were committed to it. So when we passed this two months ago, it had the commitment of everybody. But okay. in the thinking strategically about this, to Nick's point, it doesn't make sense to do this at this point because we're going to make cuts on other things that the point about Dave was saying about these two positions that is not short term. Those are long term strategies mm -hmm. that we had for those people to deal with. The, I know, but that, to, that, I know. That, this let me let me finish. Let me finish, please. To deal with the chronic drug issue that we are finally addressing in this town, and part two is the addressing the revenue stream that we need by getting those tasks that are getting bottled up. Mm -hmm. We knew that needed to be done. We knew those are long term because we put a tax increase in place to support those things over and above what we would normally do. So we were thinking about it. This is the time for tightening the budget until we know the full gravity of what we really have. If it comes to pass that it's not as bad as we're thinking, what have we lost because we've been doing this either incorrectly or not at all for several years and we're still growing and moving positively every year. So for us not knowing what we're doing, I think we've done a pretty good job. So we've got an old roadmap to use. That's, uh, we do have a strategic plan. And as we look at a potentially smaller number of resources to apply to that strategic plan that was identified before, that's what's guiding staff's actions. So when, just, just know that. And that's the reason why I brought it up now. I wondered if you wanted to engage in this discussion so that it could inform our decision about how to apply those future limited resources. And I, 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 I agree with you, mm -hmm. uh, but to the point that everyone else has made, you know, we, we just, we have to be conservative, mm -hmm. super conservative, because, I, I mean, I would, I really would love to have somebody who is an expert in this area to come along and help us do this, because it will pay dividends far down the road. Mm -hmm. But the immediate need is to conserve as much cash as possible. And, you know, I mean, I will champion this all day long, but first and foremost is to just gather ourselves and understand what position we're going to be in. And then we can, we can go back and we can, you know, because I'd rather get another community development person. I want to get that officer in here. I mean, those are, those are important. I mean, important enough to Marty's point, we, you know, we budgeted for it. We, we increased taxes for that. So, I mean, that's something we really have to consider. Well, and, and beyond that, I would say let's, let's keep a running list, too, of even some of these smaller things. Because especially, you know, the, the staff banquet. I mean, staff's done a great job over the past years, as, as we've said time and time again, of finding ways to stay under budget on numbers of items. You know, that deserves recognition. Yeah. And, and you start cutting short on the, hey, thank you, and, and all of a sudden, you're not yeah. seeing as much effort. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I'd like to keep a running list of those items, too. Uh, do, we do, we have, do we have 20 more front loaders that we're going to be <laughs> buying or selling? I mean, that's <laughs> 20 grand a pop right there. They were. Oh. <laughs> I, I just, to Susan's point, I, I think sometimes we have difficulty following through on whatever we plan. Okay, I mean, you know, the next election, it's going to be a whole new face on the council. And mm -hmm. then 
people will not follow through. The council as a whole will not follow through. Not individuals, but a whole unit will not follow through. Uh, I, I would propose that we put a review of the current strategic plan on the agenda in the immediate future. Because I think that a lot of thought went into the strategic plan that we did six years ago, <clears throat> five years ago. And, and look at what our goals were and our mission statement, et cetera, and then see how we are doing in comparison to those goals. I think that would be a good jumping off place instead of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's a good idea, Susan. When would you like to have that discussion? When do you have time? <laughs> Next Tuesday? <laughs> no. That's awfully quick. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you got enough time to prepare. Ooh, really, I'm really committed. I'm really committed on that one. Staff's going to call their bluff. Strategic <laughs> plan and, and what their thoughts are on on where where the plan would need improvement. But I didn't think that that. Size. I thought it was just Susan said that you guys, as a council, were looking at. Do you want that for staff to review the strategic plan and? I think, I think it would be really good for all of us to review it and mm -hmm. see what's right. there. I mean, I think yeah. that's a good point. And it. that's something that I think plans are great. Plans are wonderful, especially if you get a really good plan. But if you don't use it and implement it and review it and go back and say, okay, we said we we're going to do this and we never did it, mm -hmm. or we did one out of the 10 things that were in it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much we spend on it or how much time we put into it or how much we believe in a plan. It doesn't mean anything unless we use it and we implement it and we hold ourselves accountable for when we don't do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest thing that I'll say over the time I've been on the council, I'm probably at fault on some of it, but we have not done that. We have not said, okay, what, what did that plan actually say? I mean, I look around the table here and I wonder how many of us could actually say what's in it. I think staff's done a good job in, in the beginning of each budget explaining what we've done and what they've done and how it ties <coughs> to our goals and objectives but um, they're getting old mm -hmm. right and I understand that but again we don't have to reinvent the wheel if we have a plan and we had ten things that we wanted to accomplish in it and we only accomplished one there's a whole lot left to do so, so what do you want to do have it at a meeting where we can block out two hours where we can just have general discussion about the plan I think that would be the best place for us to start yeah. I mean from my feeling right now is I don't know that I want to say yes to spending another 30 or 40 grand on another strategic plan before I look back at the other one and we can all agree that, wow, we really need to start over and go forward. Or so, Laura, can you send it to everyone? Yes. Right. And, and then, you know, we'll plan a time to sit down and look at that, decide, okay, do we have to really reinvent it or can we use what we have? I think that if you look at other cities' strategic plans, the framework is very similar from community to community. And so if we look at what our goals were and say, oh, okay, we accomplished this goal, so now let's replace that with a new goal, I don't think we, I need a facilitator to help me with that. The biggest thing we need is a facilitator to help us you implement raise your hand. the stuff. <laughs> I did. Yeah, I do. I, I, I think I think part of having some an expert in this area is, is helping us to use a cliche, think outside the box a little bit. Um, you know, for communities just to, to roll over and, and you know plug in new goals, the way the economy is changing, the way you know things are changing, you have to attack municipality governance in a much different way than you did 10 years ago. And in your planning, I mean, strategy for, you know, for development has changed in the last five years. And, and it's different from community to community. If you have a river coming through your community versus if you're on the plains versus if you're in the city, all that's changed. So you can't just cookie cutter this thing. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot to it. Um, again, it's part of what I do during the day. I hold businesses accountable because I know left to their own devices, they don't do it. And there's, there's a spot for that. There really is. So 
you know, again, this needs to be pushed. That's, that's the right thing to do. But I would say we need to look at that. And we do need to review our current plan. Everyone needs to be on the same page for that. And I think what you'll find is it's going to be lacking. But we need to get to that point, and we need to come to consensus as a council. One of the things we've talked about doing right, annually, but we've never gotten to it, is making it part of the budget process. So, I mean, in this year, maybe we can get a head start on it. And what we're doing would be, you know, just reviewing it and looking at it and determining, you know, what our budget needs before. And this is what many other communities do. And then you get that and hand it to staff in October, or I mean, in August, and so they can run with it. Yeah. I think, as has been said, Nobody's saying to kill it in its entirety, to put it off. And to that point, I think we are maintaining adequate operating reserves and fund balances in light of the current situation. So we're following the strategic plan by doing that. <laughs> one down. <laughs> so what am I hearing? Lucy, this is you. Well, um, I think that we are going to pick a couple hours sometime where we're all in a good mood and committed to this. <laughs> good. <laughs> That'll never and happen. Ready, ready to go and really uh, review the strategic plan that we have. And uh, Nick doesn't feel that we're quite ready next week. No, <laughs> season, next I month? I kind of agree with you. I mean, we have a lot going on right now. Yeah. I mean, Give it a month because there are uh, there's there's the short version and the long version of the document. Okay, I think that the long version of the document is about 15 pages long. So, all right. So, well, I guess so. When we're all in a good mood, we don't have to worry about that liquor tax going down anymore. <laughs> Fair enough. Are you proposing so working maybe for yep. next week we can try to come up with um, commit a meeting mm -hmm. to going over the strategic plan. All right. Okay. Item 19, project status. Good. Um, as an initial matter, I wondered if um, we've got coming up on February 20th is the um, Brotherhood dinner. And so I wondered if that was going to interfere with the meeting, if there were a number of you that were going to be attending that dinner, or if most everyone was going to be here. I, I have to go to that that Well, we've always conducted it, even even though that Brotherhood meeting has been that night, which I've never been able to attend that Brotherhood meeting because of a committee meeting. Um, I guess my position on it would be I'd love to go to the Brotherhood meeting instead of the committee meeting, but if we have business that needs to be taken care of, I think we need to take care of business. It's the night that Chris had scheduled the branding discussion. <laughs> Oh, we could kill that, too, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I knew that was coming. Uh, I knew that was coming. Uh, I'm with you. I just love to bring that home. And if you're going to talk about it, I'd like to ask if you put it near the, the end of the meeting so maybe I can get here for a part of the discussion. Um, would you want to have your committee meeting on Wednesday that week instead? Planning Commission. <laughs> oh. Thursday night. Now you're pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's Metro West. It needs to be on Tuesday or not at all. Those are our CDC or those are our committee at home meetings. Yeah. Okay, so uh not on What else do we have that night, do we know? Are we gonna have other things the branding that it could be at the end of the meeting? Be. You think we'll have one Washington to us by then? No. <laughs> Can we push the, uh, Chris, push the branding meeting to the following week? That's sure. what I'm thinking. 27th? Okay. So we'll cancel the 20th. All right. Sounds good. Um, so just to update you on community development and economic development, Shore is busy. Um, along with the zoning submittal that we received for Windmill Landings, that's not to be confused with Windmill Manor, which is the project already under construction. And I happened to notice while I was watching CNN this weekend, Windmill Manor was actually advertising on television for 
um, rental of their the units in their building already. So that, that was good news. And right across the street from it is going to be a similarly um, assisted living development with um, another 80 units in it. Uh, we received the new submittal for the Prairie Commons development on Kirk Road at Wind Energy Pass. Mm -hmm. Um, we've received the submittal from Dollar Tree Stores for a permit for the old de Office Depot space on Fabian Parkway. Um, 206 East Wilson Street, we've had further discussions with the property owner's architect concerning a proposed multi-story mixed-use building there. And the developer expects to come here sometime in March to make a presentation um, to all of you as an initial matter before moving forward with that project. Um, uh, it was mentioned before that we have a new restaurant, La, uh, La oh, actually this was not the one that Marty mentioned, but um, we've had some pre presentations from the gentleman who is going to open La Casa del Pescatore at 35 North Water Street, which is the former range restaurant space. And then also um, we have the Furniture Frenzy store, which is a 7,000 square foot space that's in the Windmill Lakes Shopping Center. Um, in public works, we have Metronet is continuing to perform installations as well as restoration work. We had a little bit of a blip with some messy restoration work that was done, but I was impressed with the, um, the crew leader for Metronet that uh, not only did he say he'd look into it, but he said, I'm getting in my truck and I'm driving over there right now <laughs> to go check it out. Um, Streets was, has been focused on our winter operations and, and parkway tree pruning when we can. Streets and water staff um, have re re <coughs> training on uh, a new sewer camera that was purchased. And um, they met with a sewer flusher truck vendor uh, which is important because that is a significant cost for that vehicle. We want to make sure that we um, partner with the right company for that. We continue to update the solid waste contract specifications. Engineering staff is reviewing qualifications for upcoming engineering consultant projects and building and grounds has continued progress on the public works air quality and city hall. Um, uh, we want to get the remodeling project here ready on a shelf so that at the time such time as we're ready to implement it it's ready to go so those are some of the things that we're working on real quick question for yes. Gary while he's here um, how does public works think the new brine and salt treatments have worked over those couple of events we've had so far So when the weather cooperates, kind of not like this weekend where it rains all the time, <laughs> uh, but when the weather cooperates, it's really, I mean, those delay call-outs. Mm -hmm. So when you're delaying call-outs, you're delaying overtime hours, and subsequently you don't have to put as much initial salt on the street. So okay. that's the whole point of it is to keep that initial, that, that's all you're going to accomplish. It's not a panacea mm -hmm. to solve all those problems. Right. It's, it's to delay a couple of hours of call-outs, and it's, it's to delay the first you know, couple tons of salt. So, so far, very good okay. for, for what it is. Great, because I mean, the, the comments that I've got back from the public, first of all, it was, wow, what are all the streets striped for? <laughs> and then, you know, whatever I think everybody is, or at least I've noticed, and a lot of the streets I've tried to frequent to see how it's changed it, it seems to be a lot better, especially on the hills. Yeah, I think you see it, a, if you drive throughout Chicagoland now, it's become a, a regular mm -hmm. practice. I mean, it's not a unique thing to be taken. We're, we're one of the last ones to hop on board. <laughs> yeah, they do, unless we go. Anybody else? Okay. Do we have any others? No others? Let's go on then to executive session. I need a motion to enter into executive session for the purpose of setting the price of land for sale and sale or, or purchase of real estate. So moved. Second. Who was, who was the motion? Motion by Sharon, second by your. All in favor? Something like that. Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Me. Wolf.